Council for Monday, November 27th, 2023 to order. Um, first, I'd just like to recognize the City of Dawson Creek acknowledges that we are privileged to live and work on Treaty 8 territory and the traditional home of the Cree, Danize, Soto, Sikini, and Slavey First Nations. We value the Métis people that live here, live and gather here. We commit to upholding the respectful relationship these nations have built with the land and we acknowledge our responsibility to carry that forward and into the future. Um, first order of business is to uh, corporate officer to read aloud the notice of public hearing. Over to you, Tab. Good morning. Good morning. This public hearing is being held to hear from anyone that may be affected by the proposed amendments to the city's zoning bylaw. Zoning Amendment 23-06, Bylaw 4573 2023, proposes to permit metal storage containers as an accessory use in the P2 Recreation and Culture Zone, P2 Exhibition Ground Zone, and NIS2 Municipal Use Zone under the conditions of Section 5.19.2 as an amendment to zoning bylaw number 4450-2020. If the zoning amendment is approved, metal storage containers would be used as a temporary storage solution for the city's event and sports supply as staff continue to source more permanent and cost-effective solutions to ensure long-term storage needs are addressed. To date, there have been no comments received to the zoning amendment. Okay, thank you, Tab. You're welcome. Um, and is there any correspondence or delegations? I'm assuming no. No. Um, all right, I will call uh, uh, three times for comments. So I'll call in once for any comments. Twice for any comments. And three times for any comments. I will declare this, uh, close this public hearing, so. All right, I'd like to call our regular meeting of City Council with Committee of the Whole for Monday, November 27th, 2023 to order. Um, first order of business is two delegations. Um, 2.1, we have Ms. Fiona Wynn and Janice MD, um, Adoption Social Worker, Ministry of Children and Family Development in Attendance regarding the proclamation to declare November 2023 as Adoption and Permanent Permanency Awareness Month. So welcome Janice and Fiona, and you can come up here. Um, yeah, you can stand okay. here. I, I don't even know if it matters, but that's okay. usually where everyone stands. So, so well. first time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, whereas adoptive families and permanent families in British Columbia provide the love and support of permanent family, and whereas the government of British Columbia wishes to recognize the care, compassion, and unselfish commitment of British Columbia adoptive families and permanent families, and whereas there continues to be a need for adoptive families and permanent families to nurture the growth and development of children, especially those with special needs because of age, physical, mental, or emotional disabilities and sibling groups. Now, therefore, I do hereby proclaim the month of November 23rd November 2023 <laughs> as Adoption and Permanency Awareness Month. So, congratulations. Thank so, you. Um, so I did have a couple notes on it. So every November, BC recognizes Adoption and Permanency Awareness Month to draw attention to children and teens waiting for a place to call home, whether it be through adoption, guardianship, kinship placement, Indigenous customary care, or another home with potential to be a long-term fit. Uh, this was shocking to me. There are currently 2,616 children and youth waiting for permanent families across BC, uh, and 41 of them living in the Peace Region. So it's uh, it's definitely a real thing, and it's amazing that you know you two do this daily and um, have adopted some. So it, it's just amazing to to be able to do this today. Um, and just want to thank you both for coming in today to share this cause with us. Uh, we appreciate your constant day today work for the future of the children at, you know, in our province, region, in our communities. So we also want to recognize and ce celebrate all the people who open their homes up to children um, who are lacking their own primary love and care. So I don't think there's enough words that um, say like what you do and 
how that makes the, the difference in youth. But, but definitely thank you for the treat. So, yeah. I will sign this here. Did you want to say anything? No? Okay. I think, um, I don't know if Melissa or somebody wanted to take a picture. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're, you're we're welcome. Our <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for all the work you do, so. Perfect. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, guys. Next for business was 2.2. Is it soon ready? Okay. Uh, we have Miss Kathy Peters, BC anti human trafficking educator, speaker, and advocate in attendance via Zoom uh, regarding child sex trafficking in BC and how to stop it. So, welcome, Kathy. Great. Thank you very much, Your Worship. So, my name is Kathy Peters. Three years ago, I started the Be Amazing campaign to stop sexual exploitation. My website is beamazingcampaign.org. It is a one-stop shop on the issue with my interviews, presentations, resources, handouts, and information so that you can have a thorough understanding and overview of human sex trafficking and specifically how to stop child sex trafficking. I just added my two videos from an Abbotsford event I give an overview of the crime and an interview with a survivor. These are worth watching. This type of presentation needs to occur in every community in BC. My new book is now available online, Child Sex Trafficking in Canada and How to Stop It. It is the textbook on the issue in Canada. It is readable, relatable, with well-documented resources. Many of you bought it at UBCM when you came to my booth. Please donate a copy to your library, hospital, police detachment, and schools. My mission statement, a modern, equal, civil society does not buy and sell women and children. My goal, to raise awareness about sexual exploitation so it can be identified and stopped. 45 years ago, I was an inner city high school teacher and saw sexual exploitation in my junior high school. For the past 10 years, I've been raising awareness with politicians, all three levels of government, the police, and the public. This is the fastest growing crime in the world and one of the most lucrative. The global sex trade is targeting youth and children because this is where the money is. It is fueled by the internet where most of the luring is taking place. I submitted three important resources to council. Number one, an overview of the crime handout. It summarizes the problem. Number two, eight strategies for municipalities handout. And number three, the link for a 2004 UBCM resolution on child sex trafficking that went on to the FCM and federal government. My concern is that I do not see the federal government following up with specific actions. Therefore, the lack of public awareness persists in Canada and the crime is growing. In a past email to council, I also sent the link for the OCTIP free online course. That is BC's Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons. And I encouraged all of your team and staff to view it. It is an eight to 12 hour training course, but I will not be redundant here. My concern the sex industry in Vancouver and Victoria specifically are promoting and pushing for the full decriminalization of prostitution, legalization for all of Canada. This has occurred in Germany where prostitution was legalized, for example, and the result is an explosion of demand resulting in a collective degradation of women across society. It has triggered forced prostitution involved organized crime, resulted in human trafficking and child sex trafficking. Prostitution and trafficking cannot be delinked. Trafficking for the purpose of prostitution is multi-traumatic. Women and girls, some boys, are slapped, bitten, spat on, verbally abused, beaten, 
sat on until they cannot breathe, forcibly impregnated, raped, gang raped, raped with a weapon, anally raped, nearly drowned in a tub or toilet, choked, suffocated, porn photos taken, porn snuff films made, forced to watch others harmed, threatened to be killed, and the list goes on and on. The stats. The average age of recruitment into the sex industry is 13 years old, much younger for Indigenous girls. In Vancouver and Victoria, the age has dropped to 10 to 12-year-old girls. 54% in the sex trade are Indigenous, 70 to 90% in cities. 82% had childhood sexual abuse or incest. 72% live with complex PTSD. 95% in prostitution want to leave. 90 to 99% are pimped or trafficked. Only 1 to 5% of individuals exit the sex industry. The majority are severely drug addicted, mentally ill, commit suicide, or are murdered. Think Robert Picton, the notorious sex buyer and serial killer from Port Coquitlam. The federal law, PSEPA, or Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act, targets the demand and criminalizes the buyer of sex and profiteers. The sex seller is immune from prosecution. There are supposed to be exit strategies in place and prevention education to keep youth out. This law is not enforced in BC. So I just want to make three points and then conclude with my two asks. Number one, I recently presented to the graduate women, international university women from all over the world attended. Their concern, the sex industry globally is pressuring governments to fully decriminalize prostitution, legalize it. Prostitution everywhere in the world is unequal, unhealthy, unsafe, and unfair to women. Prostitution does not make women more equal or advance the equality or the quality of women and girls. It is a step backwards. The full decriminalization of prostitution emboldens a much larger buyer's market. Where does the supply come from? With globalization, victims are moved around the world, typically from developing countries to developed countries. (coughs) Prostitution destroys people. There is no good prostitution because all prostitution is violence. From the hundreds, maybe thousands of survivors I've spoken to, they all tell me there is no such thing as safe prostitution. And because there is so much money involved, prostitution is associated with a world of organized crime. Number two, I presented to the Oak Bay City Council last Monday Their school liaison officers have been removed from the Greater Victoria School District, and they wanted to know from me what the alternative is. I said there is no alternative, because it's only law enforcement that can stop crime in schools, and they need to reinstate those officers back into the schools. Otherwise, organized crime moves in. This happened in the Vancouver School District and the officers have all been reinstated. So school liaison officers are very important in all schools to stop crime. The mayor then asked me why the federal law is not enforced in BC. The answer, there is no political will provincially to do so. While this should not be a partisan issue, the current party has a party policy platform to fully decriminalize prostitution or legalize prostitution in Canada. This would be a disaster. Look at Germany where violence, organized crime, human trafficking, and child sex trafficking have exploded. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz has just stated that sex work is no longer acceptable in Germany. Also, with the longest border in the world, Canada would become America's brothel and the indigenous women and girls would be first casualties. Point number three, social housing for the homeless and vulnerable. This is an issue now where I live in the district of North Vancouver. I just asked my council one question. 
Is drug use allowed? Because if so, crime will be involved and will spread into the community. If organized crime permeates the housing, and this certainly has happened in other communities, human trafficking and sex, child sex trafficking will likely develop for the purpose of prostitution. These crimes go hand in hand. The District of North Vancouver already has Canada's most prolific human trafficker, Reza Mazami. He's in jail now, who trafficked numerous women and girls. So I have two asks. Number one, could you write a letter to the new federal justice minister, Arif Varani, and federal public safety minister, Dominic LeBlanc, that the federal law PSEPA needs to be enforced consistently in all of Canada, along with a national rollout campaign. Please CC the BC Premier David Eby, Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, and Attorney General Nikki Sharma, because BC is neither enforcing the law, providing the funding and training needed to enforce the law, and has no publicly visible prevention education strategies. And I can provide a template letter or examples from other jurisdictions. Number two, are there other agencies I could present to in Dawson Creek? For example, in Vanderhoof, I got to present to the Chamber of Commerce and Connexus, that's their frontline service providers. To Enderby, I presented to their frontline service providers. Thank you so much, and I hope there's some questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, I'll open it up to Council first. If there's any questions? Councillor Parslow. Yes, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, just a question. Uh, you, you cited Germany, where I guess the, the legislation has been uh, recently changed and you outlined the impact. How would you describe the situation in Holland? Uh, <laughs> it's just as bad in Holland, but if you're following the international news, there is now a new prime minister uh, conservative prime minister that's just been voted in there. So I'm optimistic he will change things around. Um, Holland, Germany, of course, are problematic. Uh, New Zealand has also just voted a conservative government. I am known internationally for my work, and I just sent my book to the um, attorney general in New Zealand and got a very prompt response because they have fully decriminalized prostitution in that country. And now it's become a global sex tourism um, destination. So I'm hopeful the conservative government there will reverse their laws. Uh, Rhode Island was like Nevada uh, um, many years ago, and they reversed their laws. I mean, we've got a great law in Canada. I don't want to lose it, but it does need to be enforced. The reason I asked about Holland is that they've had, um, how can we call it, uh, a pretty open system um, for years. And I just wondered, is organized crime as heavily embedded in Holland? Uh, some of the ramifications that you cited, are they, is that true for Holland uh, as well? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I don't think uh, there's any more, Kathy. I just wanted to um, thank you for uh, one coming in to present to us, but also um, for all the work you're doing in this. And you know, obviously, it's uh, you know a big, a, a, you know, a big concern and issue. And um, just wanted to you know thank you for bringing the awareness to us, but also you know provincially and federally and worldwide. So. Um, and I, I have your two asks. I wasn't able to write down the first one completely, but we will have that. And then uh, later on when we get to our mayor's updates, we'll go through that and, um, and get direction from council where we're going to go. So, yeah, so thank you very much for, for joining us this morning. So, Thank you very much, everybody. You're welcome. Um, all right, our next order of business is 2.3. We have Mr. Alex Reshny, President, and Mr. Joe Hauber, Vice President, South Peace Mile Zero, Park Society in attendance uh, regarding the 2024 project update. So good morning, gentlemen, and thank you for the detailed package and, and for everything. Good to see Joe got up today. <laughs> Councillor Parzel's mic's not on, so that's uh, yeah. You know, I just <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Welcome. The floor is yours. So. Well, well, thank you, Your Worship, and councillors and city staff. Uh, the South Peace is here to present our plans for three areas we manage in the, for the city. First, our, plan, our plans for the continued development of Rotary Recreation Park and enhancing the attractions for the city and tourism. And if you can see our six principal guidelines that we look at for any additions to the lake, which we uh, also use as our guidelines for uh, the campsite and also the Pioneer Village. We try to stick to where it, it is long lasting, low maintenance, practical to operate, sustainable, and inclusive to people of all ages, bringing people together and family oriented. The next page will be our uh, projects, which we will bounce back and forth to. Uh, we have a list of capital projects for the Rotary Recreation Park on both sides of the creek. The Rotary Recreation Park is MOP's main focus for the next two years as we seek fun, uh, and find funding to complete these projects. You can follow the brochure we handed out for our proposed locations and ideas. Some of the, the things on the brochure will take a little longer than the two years, but hopefully the main attractions can be in place. One of our first ones is an addition of a misting pad. We have one now, but it was designed for ten to ten, two to ten year olds, but not, uh, not as a standalone, but in addition to Rotary Lake. And that did not work out. As you know, we lost the lake. Uh, we would like to add a second misting pad, one for all ages, for all people with wheelchair accessibility. If we can bring up uh, some of our pictures of the, that we go through on the lake, or on the misting pad. It's got an introduction, South Meal is looking at phase two of an additional splash pad, so you can... If we can make a handout for later, yeah, that's the, the one that is, uh, looks like what we're going to put up. It's uh, basically built for all ages, including wheelchair accessibility. The pad is approximately 2,700 square feet uh, with a three-foot border of rubber matting to be put around the outside as an anti-slip device and also to keep it, the pad clean. Uh, the smaller one, we can just roll through some of those pictures because I won't sit and describe every one. You can see that it's quite high, made for people quite a bit taller than me too. So, And I think there will be one where you can see the wheelchair roll, roll through there, or it probably was there. And then the last one is the, the layout. So, But it is, is basically an adult, youth, family oriented one uh, maybe it was down it'll be the, towards the end the picture of the wheelchair going going through the splash pad so there it is the smaller one uses 40 gallons a, a minute or nine cubic meters an hour the proposed one uses 70 gallons a minute or 16 cubic meters per hour. The combined use would be 25 cubic meters per hour or 250 in a 10 hour day of steady running, which we know doesn't happen. But the hours would that we run now for the existing pad is from 10 in the morning till eight in the after, or eight at night. Uh, what we do need is a two inch water line to feed the second misting pad. The line that used to feed the lake uh, has a break in it over on Tubby's side. so. Uh, it, the last time it was used was uh, a year after the lake closed, and since then we don't have a water line uh, other than the one existing line that basically feeds the misting pad today and the change room and, and bathrooms there. And the new one needs a two-inch line. The old one was a one-and-a-half-inch line with a half-inch spare going up to the bathrooms and stuff. So. Uh, some might wonder why we don't go to a, recirculate, a recirculating system which would use less water. Sorry, we've been there. The cost of operation outweighs the water consumption. The cost of daily operation was extremely high. And that's why after a great deal of extensive research, we are going to a misting pad, not a splash pad. If we made it a splash pad, it would use probably close to two cubic meters a minute. And uh, 
the existing, the splash pad uh, and the misting pad both get you wet and cool you off. When I said costs are extremely high, our last year of operation, the splash pad cost uh, mops $97,000 plus to operate, and the city contributed $50,000 of this. The costs include chemical parts, mainly electrical and labor costs of the person on duty, not the true cost of our labor. Replacing electrical components for three to 10,000 annually since year one, the system was only six years old when we switched it to misting. In order to have operated another year, we would have needed the electrical con chemical control unit, which was going to cost at the time $12,000. So that was part of the change. The labor was the other big factor. Whenever it is switched on, we had to have a person sitting there. So 10 hours to sit there, whether you, there was anybody on the pad or not, we just had to have somebody there in case somebody turned it on. Uh, along with the cleaning and regulating chemicals, we were spending an average of 13 hours a day. This year, after switching it to a misting pad, it was under two hours a day. The new proposed misting pad would cost approximately 700000 when complete would operate out of the same C can as the smaller pad. The new pad would have its own control panel to prevent water wasted. So each pad would operate off its own switch. So when you hit the switch on one, it wasn't gonna turn them both on. It's an extra $3,000 for the control panel, but that way we're not wasting water on either side. What we do need is a proper water line brought in. And I'm not sure we won't need a fire hydrant in the, in the area in the future. There is one now located at the back of Sedaton Hall, and I'll be happy to work with the city and research it and get more information on it. And the other issue is the existing water line that comes from Tubby's side would need to be relocated as the new proposed pump track would be built directly on top of it and cost, could possibly get damaged when we do some excavation work, but may might be already damaged and done for because the new playground got built directly the, the water line just ran down the uh, would have been alongside what the lake was but directly to the change room 72 holes got punched in for the new playground and the water line is only buried two to three feet below we won't know if it's wrecked or not until basically this coming spring this coming spring when the rubber matting is poured and put down for the new playground we would like to see if it's possible to put rubber matting down around the existing mat misting pad to stop the debris coming on. And also, it's a non-slip material, so it'll make it much safer. We'll be happy to work with Ryan and Molina to get costs and what we need to do to prepare and make this happen. The Teen Challenge Playground, which was on our list of things to do, uh, is pushed to, to 25-26. Our proposed big project for the year will be the pump track, bike skills track, and the beginner's pump track. The pump track is, in reality, an all-wheels track for all ages. We've hired a design development team, Velo Solutions, from Richmond, to engineer and design the track. These are the same people and firm that did the one in Tumbler Ridge, plus many more in BC. We do want ours to be totally different than the one in Tumbler Ridge, so we can promote theirs, they can promote ours. That way the RV campground on both sides of the park could possibly keep tourists in the area longer. The pump bike track is also the reason for the all-seasons bathrooms, as we could still be open today, we could be using the pump track, and we would be able to open in spring as soon as the snow melts. This year, 2023, we'd, we'd been open from April till December. It could also be part of the proposed snowshoe trails working with the golf course people. This would allow local families, both city and rural, to use the RV sites and spend time enjoying the amenities of the Rotary Recreation Park, Pioneer Village, and things around the city. In order to build a track, there are six trees that would need to be removed along with the root systems, which is what we would look after as the roots would be damaged as the excavation and groundwork is done and the trees would die in the next few years. Uh, anyway, adding an unnecessary expense. If you take a look at the map, uh, tracks and, and turn, oh yeah, move one more up here and see if we got a picture of the, the tracks and uh, of the pump track. If you, nope, back, yeah, that one. If you take it and turn it 90 degrees, the kids pump track uh, would be facing the misting pad and the playgrounds and the bike skills track would be along the creek.
I, and I can end there because I've got too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The rest is basically the RV sites in Pioneer Village, which is on the back burner as we try to get this project up and running. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you both for coming in, and uh, it's always nice to see you and, and hear um, the plans. And obviously, uh, you know, a thank you to, to all you, you guys do. So um, I will open it up to some questions from Council. <laughs> Councillor Parslow. So let's just talk about the pump tractor, um, a, a million dollars. Um, you have some major, let's say, uh, material providers. Uh, so what's going on for fundraising? I mean, I, I know I should know because we liaise a lot, but I, <laughs> I've lost track of of uh, the fundraising for the, for that right now i think and i'm not sure but we do have a grant application into mckenzie trust fund for 250,000 i will be presenting to the rural or peace river regional district here on the 18th of december and i'm hoping to get out to county of saddle hills and talk to them to see about some more fundraising <coughs> and the two Two main pushes behind it, two local contractors are also going to be fundraising through the oilmen's and other business friends and associates. So. And so the, 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 the hope for is to have that operational by? Next, late in the summer. The proposal right now, if we can get the funding in place, is to have uh, the build start in June. Right. Yes. Okay. I mean, we, we'll need approval we'll be looking for a letter of approval for the tree removal and also we're going to have to research the water line because we do have to put some kind of a bathroom in there and right now we can live with what we have because we were only opening after the the thaw but it, with the pump track going in we pretty well need an all-season <coughs> bathroom there to accommodate the longer the longer season that we can run it out there yeah It'll also probably create a second person on employment full time out there because somebody's got to go down and check it periodically. So we'll have to figure out what else we can make or help that person do so. Maintenance. Yes. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship, and thank you to our delegation for coming and visiting and providing um, a, a such a, a detailed plan. We appreciate that. It's not not always the case with some of the stuff we do. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, looking at this, I, 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 um, and whether it's the proposed pond or the uh, misting pad, is water. Um, given the year we've had and the winter we're having, I mean, this is what a drought looks like in November. Um, it, with respect to something like the pond, when we're kind of currently having discussions with the golf course around how they how to get water to them. <laughs> consistently in the event of a drought to ensure that they're able to provide and maintain their property. Um, I, I just, it, it's not really a question, this is something I'm mindful of given the conversation we've had um, and how we plan amenities around water use. But um, so, so what would be the, would the need for the potential need for the new fire extinguisher be just with relation to fire suppression as the new assets get built out there or uh, basically the the idea would be to build a, a gazebo large shelter between the pump track and or yeah where where it says rest area and there in the future would be to build a fairly large one shelter that uh, is open on all sides uh, I went and looked at the one in white court and beautiful structure but it's about mm -hmm. 40 by 40 but it would gets people out and they could actually watch the misting pad playgrounds mm -hmm. or turn their backs and watch the goings on in the pump track and the bike skills track. So okay. it's just that it, as you get more structures, there's a better chance of, of something happening. Okay. That, I don't know that we need a fire hydrant. We just need a heck of a lot more water than what we have today mm -hmm. because of the broken line on the other side and the shallow bear, like it's buried two to three feet below ground. And, yeah, that's usually eight feet yeah, around these parts is the minimum. It just prevents us from being as long-term open as we could be, especially with the pump and, and the bike skills track. We, like I said, we could be open today. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. It's uh, very interesting.
Thanks, Councillor Earl. Uh, Councillor Apollonio. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Alex and Dr. Wait, Mr. Joe for all the hard work. Yeah, I just want to know, uh, are you opening, uh, like, for example, the Pioneer Village, like, this Christmas, like, uh, lights, light shows or something, or, like, on the future projects that you like, at least to make it more, you know, appealing to the community and people gather there, like, during Christmas time? Uh, we haven't had it open for... Uh Ever since I've known it, over the the winter months, uh, basically we open it. Uh, not this Sunday, the tenth will be open because Rotary's hosting their old-fashioned Christmas with sleigh rides and hot dogs, chestnuts, whatever. But that's really there's been a couple other groups that have rented it for like a Saturday or Sunday and do the same thing. But uh, it just it uh, takes manpower and. Uh, Right now, that it isn't a feasible thing to have it open or have the buildings walked open, even to walk through, because they're all winterized and mouse proofed and and re mouse proofed this year, a second time. <laughs> yes. I think, like for example, our uh, forcing John area, I think they have this whole field with uh, lights, and then people will come in. So, like, yeah, like a light show during Christmas, but yeah, just a suggestion. We did have lights on the buildings at one time, but Historical Society made us remove them because we had staples. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Apollonio. Um, yeah, any other questions? No? Um, uh, you know, I wanted to thank you. I had a couple questions. Um, one, just thank you for the detailed package. And um, every time you guys are in here, it's it's definitely educational, and it's um, great to see what you're doing to, to better the community. Um, so the, the water line that you're talking about, is that something like what, that needs to be done before the pump track? Like, is that an ask to us to look into our 2024 budget of Yes. It, that? It, okay. it, I mean, if we don't damage it, if, if anything ever happened, we're not going to destroy the pump track to relocate a water line. And right now, like I said, it, there's a culvert. If anybody goes out there right next to the high, uh, Highway 97 South, and it, it, if you look at the where the change room is from there, look straight. That water lines run straight through the ground there, and so the guy uh, that was putting in the playground said it, he probably damaged it. I mean, how can you miss it with 72 holes going in there? So. Yeah. <laughs> and only luck would have made him miss it. Yeah. <laughs> Not trying because he knew where it was, but he said, "I just I have to do what I have to do." So. We won't know until spring we turn it on, and then we could have water everywhere. <laughs> but I'm thinking it better get done, probably looked at seriously for spring, especially if we're going to put an all-season all bathroom out there. It has to get buried the nine feet and you can do it, it right and get it over with, I guess. Okay. No, as, a, as, a, as a very first step, a guy should have a, a proposed route where it's going to go. Yeah. Like that's, the, that's the big thing to start with anyways. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, okay, and then, you know, I, we did mention earlier, I talked to you earlier about the, just the misting pad and that we have later on in council, we're bringing that up, and you did mention that you'll be working with Ryan on everything, so I, I, we don't need to get into that too much. I'm just curious if the, you had any other asks, like, today that you would need us to, to deal with one. Like, Basically a letter of, uh, that we can go ahead with the pump track. Further, I know I have the letter from a year ago to keep researching it and talk to developers. Okay which we have done and basically signed a contract with them. And as we find funding, we didn't guarantee that we'd have it in place for next June build, but I think we're having another Zoom meeting this Wednesday or Thursday with them. We had one last week, so we're just trying to get uh, the two contractors to know what they have to bring to the table and stuff. So, okay. so just a letter of support from us on yeah. the pump track. For the pump track, okay. and, and if the misting pad is a thing, I mean, we've got the, uh, the quote and everything in place, and I just know from all the research that the city of Edmonton is going to misting pads, and so is the county. Of, I got all my information from the county of Ardrossan two years ago and gave it to Blair, and so yeah. that's what made, made me look at the change. I never, it wasn't something that came into the, the brain on its own. <laughs> yeah. No, we know that. So, yeah. Um, okay, perfect. Well, thank you both for coming in, and thank you again for everything you do down there to, uh, to better the community. So we appreciate it. So thank you. You're welcome, and thank you. <laughs>
All right, our next order of business is 2.4. We have Ms. Michelle Mobley, Chair, um, and I'm thinking some Board of Directors from the South Peace Building Learning Together, uh, BLT Society in Attendance regarding Child Care Action Plan presentation. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much. You just got to push the button on the... Yep, yeah, and then I will turn it on and there we it's go. all yours. So. Sound good? Did you want to flip through the presentation at all? No, there's a presentation. Just the action plan? Oh, no, no, that's fine. All right. So first, thank you for having us here. Um, the Building Learning Together Society um, is administered through the Early Learning Division of the School District. Uh, we are a proactive community partner, providing and advocating for higher levels of programming and support for all families with young children in the South Peace. We foster collaborations, enhancing early learning and family life by focusing on the early years and helping families and children get the resources and support they need through early intervention. In 2019, funding was made available to municipalities in British Columbia who wished to create a child care action plan. Unfortunately, Dawson Creek did not pursue funding for the plan's creation at this time. However, in response to needs being expressed by parents, the members of the BLT Society, through their individual organizations, deemed it necessary to truly define the needs of childcare in our area. As the growing shortage of appropriate childcare spaces became more and more evident, the Building Learning Together Society secured funds and with the help of a contractor and member organizations, created the Child Care Action Plan. The Child Care Action Plan is a living document which contains our community's facts and figures in regards to child care. It's critical in the application for government grants such as the New Spaces Fund. With this document, child care providers are able to access funding to create and expand centers and spaces. Funding that simply isn't available without a Child Care Action Plan. Child care funding was lost to our community during those years that we had no plan, and now Dawson Creek is in a child care crisis. The results of the Child Care Action Plan uh, found that there is a dire need for additional child care spaces programs in Dawson Creek and surrounding area. These findings were comprised of both anecdotal and quantitative data collected through the creation of the plan. Affordability is not even the biggest issue. It's availability and flexibility that's really missing. We're lacking space for anyone who works before seven or after six. We have no overnight spaces, no weekend spaces. There's a shortage of childcare spaces with extra needs. And the current wait list for infant and toddler spaces exceeds two years. As of October 2022, Dawson Creek had 79 infant and toddler spaces. This is for the first three years of a child's life. We have about 400 births per year in our community. We know that not every child will need care, but at that number, we can only accommodate less than 20% of infants for each year of birth. We have 187 spaces for three to five-year-olds and 140 before and after school spaces. This often means that siblings need to be broken up and attend different daycares, which is a burden for the children and for the parents and for the family. 36% of children in Dawson Creek and area are considered to be vulnerable in one or more developmental scales. And those are social, physical, emotional, language and cognitive, and communication. When we consider that the first five years are the most important in a child's development, we cannot afford to have parents making decisions about childcare, which leave children in situations that may be not safe, nurturing, or regulated. In some cases, parents have to make the decision whether to return to work or not, simply because the care they need for their children does not exist. From shift workers in healthcare with the new hospital, um, shift workers in manufacturing at LP, to the availability of infant spaces for new parents wanting to or needing to return to work, childcare in our community is in a crisis. Some of the feedback that we heard from parents when they were asked, are there any aspects of childcare that are important to you and your family? 
So these are just a sample of what we heard back. Um, be able to accommodate for shift work. Inclusive, accessible spaces where all children are welcomed. We need special needs care. There is no child care that accommodates shift work. I have to pay for two full-time spots and two before and after school care spots and don't need them every day. What is being done to com accommodate our healthcare professionals and their child care needs? How do we retain the ones that we have and entice new ones to come if a predominantly female workforce can't access childcare? Another parent said the inability to find childcare for all three of my children at the same daycare is upsetting. I know that enticing qualified professionals of any type to come live in the north in a small town is hard, but we need them. We need educator, educators for all ages, birth to post-secondary. We need doctors, nurses, long-term facility workers. We need and have lots of tradespeople, and I am truly grateful for that. But even the working parents that we have in the city are having a ridiculous find timing, finding childcare. So those were just some of the comments that we received from parents during the creation of the plan. So over the past year, child care resource and referral has fielded many queries about the availability of child care from health care workers, professionals, and educators who have been looking at Dawson Creek to relocate. How do we encourage those families to live and work in our communities if we can't offer them child care or education? Moving forward, the Child Care Action Plan is an evidence-based plan which will guide decision-making now into 2027. The Building Learning Together Society is extending an invitation to the City of Dawson Creek to be part of the Child Care Action Plan Task Force. We are requesting the City to be part of this group so we can better address issues surrounding the lack of child care in our community <clears throat> excuse me, by way of review, reviewing policies and bylaws which support the creation of child care spaces, to help research, consider, and incorporate space for child care as part of development of new municipal facilities or for the re renovation of existing facilities, and to help determine where child care opportunities exist in the city. Northern regions have a particularly difficult time recruiting in all sectors. The Child Care Action Plan Task Force can help address the recruitment and retention issues as this is a huge component of community development, both socially and economically. Some parents have to make the choice between unlicensed or unregulated child care or not working at all. The financial and social impact of this on our community should not be ignored. Having adequate child care spaces in our community is not just an investment in the early years, it's an investment in our community's families, our community's economic growth. This is not just a parent or a caregiver issue, this is a community issue. An investment in early childhood is the most powerful investment a community can make, with returns over the course of its lifetime, many times over the original investment. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michelle, and uh, yeah, thank you for for your presentation and your words. It's definitely, um, we've had a lot of talk around youth and how important it is to us, so it definitely aligns. So uh, I appreciate um, everything you said, so thank you. Thanks. Um, I will open up to council first for questions. Councillor Parslow. <clears throat> the City of Dawson Creek bylaws are listed in your presentation, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm not asking for specific, <laughs> anything specific here, but do you have in mind that there are some impediments in the bylaw, existing bylaws that they may need revisions or I, the zoning? I am need? not the expert in that <laughs> no, one. That's Unfortunately, okay, my colleague <coughs> um, has a better idea about that. Um, but it's my understanding that there are some zoning issues that have prohibited people from opening licensed uh, child care in their homes, in residential areas. So may I respectfully suggest that sometime mm -hmm. that council gets a presentation on that because that is something that is actionable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Did you have more, Councilor Parsley? That's it. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Earl. Thank you, Worship, and hello. Thanks for coming to see us, and uh, I, it was 
a, a good report to read. Um, so I guess in our stakeholder feedback with Northern Health around the construction of the new hospital, we were hoping to get a commitment from them to include within that um, some some child care space for exactly as you noted. Mm -hmm. um, I know many LPNs and RNs who, you know, once they've got a second kid, they just quit for, you know, and, and don't go back because the costs and the time away from kids and the inability to find child care if they don't have a local support network or they're not from here and they have parents or family who can look it just becomes impossible for that to do. I don't think yeah. we had much luck or we haven't gotten that commitment. I know no. uh, we were hoping then second, <laughs> secondary to that to uh, leverage the proximity to the NLC mm -hmm. childcare space. And, and I'm not sure where the commitment is with that, but um, <clears throat> continued advocacy in that respect, mm -hmm. I think is important. Um, also, the, I think one of the challenges we have as advocates and as a parent who's got a child in childcare is um, trying to explain to the average layperson, number one, the various government programs that exist to subsidize childcare, childcare providers, training for childcare. Um, it's it's a, a dog's breakfast kind of all over the place. There's a dozen different things. And then similarly, um, you know, the various models for whether it's through a nonprofit, whether it's through a private business, whether it's someone doing who set up their basement and they do it kind of as a part-time gig while they watch their kids at home, um, having a centralized hub for information for where new and expecting parents can go because if you don't, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And when you're having your child for the first time, like the idea – you know, some people that are particularly keen or who have friends with, with kids might know you need to, as soon as you find out you're expecting, you need to start phoning around to child care spaces and looking to book a yeah. spot. Uh, many people, however, it would not occur to until you're, you know, three months left in mat leave and then, oh, I guess we can. Um, so mm -hmm. I think uh, that is an ongoing challenge. It's just how can we get everybody on the yeah. same page and how can we educate the general public on where the resources are coming from, what's available, and um, make sure we're avoiding redundancy in how we communicate that so we don't have a dozen different organizations or businesses. Um, you know, the cross-chatter kind of yeah. becomes... Well, I think that's the hope of the creation of this task force, though, is that we would have representatives from Northern Health, from the college, um, from different organizations across town. We already have Child Care Resource and Referral, who's your one-stop shop for uh, child care needs, questions, um, as well as other things. But that would be the, the role of the task force, right? And all of those uh, working members would be so, yeah. to create um, that. So the ask then here today is you want the city to spearhead the task force or you're looking for our... We would just our... like you to be a part of it. Okay. Yeah. And like as, as far as having a staff or council member or, or what kind of presence do you envision for the city? <laughs> I'm looking to my yeah. colleague. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it would be like a, 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 a council appointed li liaison or a staff member? We Council do liaison. well. We do have um, <coughs> representation with the Building Learning Together Society, but we what we are asking for specifically is somebody to be part of this task force. Okay, cool. right? and that would be somebody, um, I guess, who either has the the good connections or the power to be able to help move and change. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor uh, Councillor Apollonio. Thank you. Oh, you don't have to hit the... Oh. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Ms. Michelle, for the presentation. Well, actually, I feel you because, especially coming from my community, uh, which is like the newcomers here, uh, I normally get messages about, you know, child care, especially they come here as a new, uh, new community member. Mm -hmm. And they need to work because, of course, to support the family. And, of course, especially coming from other parts of the world, like our country. And they need support. And, of course, get back the money that 
you know, spent going here. And I know, uh, yeah, normally just the message that I come, if they normally ask me child care, child care. But of course, the only thing that they can get is, of course, just to go to the, you know, to the institution or MEG agencies like you. Uh, I, I, uh, we had just finished, I think, the September 21, uh, November 21 strategic meeting. Uh, I think uh, maybe the city council or the city staff could look on, because we have uh, spaces at the event, maybe the city staff could, could look at that uh, because we have still some spaces there. Maybe they can allocate some space there for child care. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not saying, I'm not giving you the start right now, but of course, just a, something to look upon. Yeah. But yeah, but Ideas at least. Are good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Councillor no. Apollo. Oh. Could you just no. come up to the mic? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Um, as an additional idea with what we are talking about today, the child care action plan was done two years ago. Yes. And uh, we have more families. After COVID, we have more families that need child care. So it's even more an urgency uh, from before this child care action plan was made. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a, oh, Councillor Arslow. Yeah, I, I have a few more questions, and I guess we'll let you ask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, yes, you identified one of the real big problems is qualified staff, and um, I'm pleased that uh, there is a program at this college. Have you got uh, some data on that? A reason I'm asking, and being a former educator myself, I know that programs come and they go at the college. And it and it's, so I'm wondering what assurance you have for the longevity of that program. And are you tracking, or is the college tracking, how many graduates are getting employed locally, or are they moving, as so often happens, to other communities. In other words, what's the retention rate? Uh, I think that's a very important thing to uh, try to get some insurance about and and, and to be tracking. <laughs> Mary has answers. Good. I have Great. a temporary answer here because um, not only that I'm working with the school district 59 uh, as an early learning coordinator, but I'm also an instructor of Northern Lights College teaching early childhood education. So I think I have an information, but um, um, I've been teaching since 2019 and all the students we have um, mostly are international students. Mm. We have local students, but most of them are doing the course online because mm. most of them are already in the field. But all of these educators are employed even before they graduate. Most of our students are all in the community. And I can assure you that there were 21 students last year that graduated. Most of them are in town now. They are now fully employed and still we need more educators. There are just two of our students moved to other community, but most of our students are here in town. Thank you. So, so the international students, uh, uh, do they have residency here? So they are, uh, some of them already processed their residency. Okay. Some of them are processing on process right now because the early childhood education have the, the easy, uh, one of the, having the pathway to have it uh, process more uh, faster than the other courses, I okay. think, yeah. You may want to sit there for this next <laughs> question. <laughs> if I yes. may just ask well, one no, question and, and two then questions, a though, uh, Just, just so <laughs> um, <laughs> are there any employers in this community who are providing uh, a childcare facility or some or engaged with facilitating the acquisition of childcare? I don't need the names, but I just wonder we how many. We only have, in, t in the city, we have Northern Lights College, but there are other local students who are enrolling in online courses. But I can't name the other colleges. Though, no, I mean providers. In other words, they have built a childcare facility in their premises or that they are providing and hiring staff for for childcare for their other staff? Um, I don't have that information right no. now because that's... Okay, just one or two? Uh, I can think of two. 
Good, good. Uh, just a, just a, yes. Sure. Oh, it's absolutely. I understand that. Uh, so the the other thing, it might be uh, good for the um, various organizations to, um, and I think it might be good for you guys, is to, when the city appoints somebody to attend certain meetings, they're there in a liaison function. And you need to understand, and I think you can access through the CAO what a liaison person does do and what they don't do. It might be very helpful in you formulating your ass of council, okay? So that's just some homework I suggest you do in, in conjunction with the CAO, okay? Okay. You seem puzzled. What? Just listening. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You are puzzled. No. No, no that was. No. Okay. <laughs> I was you. just listening. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Parcel. You were waiting for a response. <laughs> um, was there any other questions? Most of mine have been answered. I, you know, I definitely wanted to thank you. And this task force is so it's a new. Um, yes. It's yes. new. Okay. So you're looking for a representative from the city, yes. and I think. Um, later on when we deal with it, we'll figure out at what level that would be, but we'll probably need some more information on on what would be needed. Um, and then, you know, obviously uh, the school the school district's part of this as mm -hmm. well. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that answers everything I had and everything else was asked. But was there any other asks, Michelle, like um, as of now? Oh. Could I? Yes, please. If you could just go up to the mic, just so those that are home can hear. The original idea of uh, articulating this child care action plan is to make it part of the official community plan. What needs to be happening for that to take place? Okay. And that would be something I would have to look into. I mean, we all realize the, the importance of childcare and um, the crisis that is in the community and has been. So, I don't know, Kevin. Did you have something to like, like making that part of the community plan? Like, is it currently, or would? So, through your worship, the ask is uh, whether it's embedded into the official community plan. Yeah. Um. Or I don't have it in front of me, but I, uh, knowing, um, going off a bit of memory, I'm pretty sure that the OCP speaks to um, those sorts of aspects. I, just what the, how particular it gets, but we'd have to take a look at it. But yeah. I, um, I'm pretty sure it does speak to some of those aspects. Okay. Something we can look at. So Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, thank you Michelle. Very thank you. I'm going to call a five-minute recess. Council um, for with committee the whole back to order for Monday, November twenty seventh. Um, our next order of business was two point five. I'm just going to vary the agenda as this one's set for eleven thirty. Um, so next will be three late items. Is there any late items? Tab late items. No. Um, four new councilor business. New councilor business. Uh, councilor Earl. Thank you, Your Worship. In my capacity as the liaison for the uh, Qantas Performing Arts Center, uh, Calvin Crook Center, just want to note that their AGM goes tonight. Okay. I believe at six thirty. Don't quote me on that, but it is six. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in the facility, or you might want to put your name forward to stand as director, I'm sure they'd be happy for your presence. Thanks, Councilor. Earl. Any other new council business? No. All right, uh, next order of business, five adoption of minutes, um, 5.1 minutes of regular meeting of council, um, November 14th, 2023 for adoption. Councillor Earl, second Councillor Sudnick. Uh, we'll call this to vote. Yes. And so far, is everybody in? Yeah, vote is closed and it's carried. We only got five though. We're missing somebody. It said five. That would be seven. Six. Should be six. Should I call the vote again? I spoke to 
excuse him. <laughs> Six carried. Okay. Um, all right. Our next order. Any business arising? The next order of business is correspondence. Uh, I'm also going to vary 7.1, just as it's uh, something we'll deal with uh, after the delegation comes. Uh, so next order of business is 7.2. We have letter from Sue Kenny, General Manager, Community Futures, Peace Liard, uh, received on November 10th, 2023, regarding a request for a letter of support uh, regarding the Northeast Primary Care Paramedic Training Application. Councillor Parslow. I, s I move that we send a letter of support as requested. A second, Councillor Earl. Any discussion? No. Right. I will call this motion to vote. <coughs> vote is closed and it's carried. That one showed up. Uh, next order of business seven point three. We have a letter from Mr. Jaron Newfeld, uh, Chartered. Chartered Professional Accountant, Sandra Rose Bone Gindel, LLP, received November 10th, 2023, regarding the interim audit of the City of Dawson Creek. Uh, Councillor Earl. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that we receive for information. Do I have a second? Councillor Apollonio, any discussion on receiving for information? I will call this motion to vote. Uh, is everybody in? Uh, vote is closed. It's carried. Uh, next order of business, 7.4, letter from city, <coughs> city's grant writer, uh, received November 17th, 2023, regarding a request for resolution of support for fuel station replacement application to BC Air Access Program. Councillor Parslow. I move that the City of Dawson Creek supports the grant application to the BC Air Access Program's Aviation Infrastructure Fund for a grant of up to 427500 for the fuel station replacement project at the Dawson Creek Regional Airport. Further, the City of Dawson Creek resolves to commit the total remaining costs not funded by this grant from its budget towards the cost of this project. Thank you, Councillor Parslow. Do I have a second? Councillor Kemp, any discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Parzel. Uh, the fuel services is a, a core function yeah. at the airport for many obvious reasons, and so uh, I don't see this as an optional thing. It's a must. I agree. Thank you. Discussion? All right, I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed. It's carried. Uh, next order of business, 7.5, we have a letter from City's grant writer received on November 17th, 2023, regarding a request for resolution of support for repair airfield lighting system application to BC Air Access Program. Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Worship. I'll move the resolution that the City of Dawson Creek supports the grant application for the BC Air Access Program's Aviation Infrastructure Fund for a grant of up to 99000 for airfield lighting repairs project at the Dawson Creek Regional Airport. Further, that the City of Dawson Creek resolves to commit the total remaining costs not funded by this grant from its budget toward the cost of this project. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Do I have a second? Councillor Apollonio, any discussion? I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed and it's carried. Uh, next order business, 7.6. We have a letter from city's grant writer um, received on November 17th, 2023 regarding a request for resolution of support for airfield line painting application to BC Air Access Program. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'll move the resolution that the City of Dawson Creek supports the grant application to the BC Air Access Program's Aviation Infrastructure Fund for a grant of up to $54,000 for airfield line painting project at the Dawson Creek Regional Airport. Furthermore, that the City of Dawson Creek resolves to commit the total remaining costs not, uh, cost not funded by this grant from its budget towards the cost of this project. Thank you, Councillor Earl. Do I have a second? Well, Councillor Apollonio. <laughs> Any discussion? Did you want to? Um, just uh, one quick question through you to staff, if I could, Your Worship. Uh, with respect to this, and I guess the other three grant or a couple grants we're applying for with respect to the airport today, I know uh, for ACAP funding, 
um, one of the requirements is often that we have a uh, commercial scheduled flight that, that enables us to apply for a lot more. And I note that I, I assume as we're applying for these, that's not a requirement of it, but to what extent, um, and, and maybe you don't have the specialization, but to what extent are we going to be hindered moving forward in applications for grants like this <laughs> if we don't have a secure commercial scheduled flight at our local airport or yeah. at our regional airport, I should say? So three, your worship, um, you're correct. Without scheduled flights, um, we do not qualify for what is called ACAP, um, but we do qualify for BCAP, which is what you see in front of you. And, and so BCAP is just something less than 100%. And in these cases, it's great. It's it's 90% funding. Others you may see, you know, go down to where it's 50-50 split. So um, it still enables us to get some funding, just not at the same levels of um, the ACAP. Okay. And as f far as we're aware, then, as we apply for these grants, one of the, the conditions, you know, as they, they, they have their grading matrix or whatever you want to call it, um, are we losing points or, or are we not competing or are we worried we're not going to be able to compete because we don't have right. that? To be honest, I... I that I don't know okay. off the top. Uh, I just know the differenti differentiation between scheduled and non-scheduled in the ACAP and BCAP. And so, um, you know, whether it comes down to, you know, how many uh, movements we have in a day, whether that helps with, with any of it, um, I'm uncertain. But. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor. Thanks, Kevin. Um, any other discussion? No. I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed and it's carried. Um, all right, next order of business is report eight, reports. 8.1, we have report number 23-155 from the Community Culture and Recreation Manager regarding Splash Park development. Councillor Apollonio. Thank you, Your Worship. That report number 23-155 from the Community Culture and Recreation Manager regarding Splash Park development be received. Further, the council directs staff to finalize engagement, identify a preferred location, and bring a budget forward for this nation Splash Park. Thank you, Councillor Apollonio. Do I have a second? Councillor Sudnick? Um, discussion? <clears throat> Councillor Parslow? So I have a lot of questions uh, here. I'm interested in hearing directly from Chelsea about one question because the CAO has already given me the answer. <laughs> so I'm testing you, Chelsea. <laughs> no, Chelsea, I always appreciate your work. It's a pleasure to have you on staff. Listen, um, I don't understand, or maybe I want to have a definition or the parameters of the words finalize engagement. Kevin, did you want to, or you want? That's not the question I want to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> so three of worship, Chelsea can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, what I understand is that we've had some initial uh, discussions with the group that uh, the mayor and I met with earlier this year, um, the folks that were um, came to us specifically about a splash park in the community. So we've met with that. Um, but I do believe that um, engagement, there needs to be more not only with that group, but it probably needs to go beyond that into, you know, different areas of, of the community to, to determine, to an help answer some of those questions of, what is it? Where is it? Those aspects. Um, again, as as we've talked in the past, is we need to ensure that we we have some parameters around that. That it's not a wide open um, wish list, so to speak, because um, uh, the most dangerous thing you can do is do that it, only to come back and say, "Well, that's great, but we can't we can't actually do any of that because it's not practical or it's too exp whatever that might be." So, um, going into any of that engagement with um, some parameters to keep it realistic and achievable, if 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 so be. So, Jels, do you have anything you want to add to that? 
So through your worship, um, I think the definition of finalizing engagement probably comes with defining what engagement is in the first place. Um, I'm not going to lie. This report was really challenging to write because it was more of a, here's a whole bunch of information to hand over to you. Now let me hear what you would like back so then we can work forward. So I think it's really dependent on what uh, direction staff receives. Um, and then we can build in what, en what engagement looks like from there, right? Because there's so many different levels of engagement. Um, but, but like Kevin said, we okay. have met with that group. Okay, so um, I appreciate um, what you're saying, how difficult it would be um, to write sometimes when you're not quite sure where you're heading. Um, I was wondering if finalized engagement was you were going to finalize a contract with a provider. And I hear that's, that's not the case, which is good. Uh, you're going to finalize community engagement. The second question, um, and you use in your report uh, and I'm not reading it in front of me. I'm just going from memory here. But you'll jump in with the actual facts, I'm sure. You'll say that with the recirculating model rather than the flow-through model, there will be a cost recovery of, it's either three to five years or five to seven. I've forgotten that. But the five-year is definitely <laughs> in there. Um, I think it would be helpful for council for you to expand on that because I have an understanding from asking staff what was meant there, but I, I think the rest of council may be operating under the wrong assumption that I was operating, so I think it's best to be heard from you rather than me. So what do you mean, what are you referring to, to cost recovery? For sure. So through your worship, um, in speaking with the Habitat consultants, so they're one of the main consultants for these splash parks, so they have quite of information in comparing recirculation and domestic systems. The cost recovery comes from um, a couple of different examples they've developed within their materials, and it compares water usage, um, it compares operating costs as in how many hours of maintenance it would be in comparison from a domestic to a research, electrical costs, uh, chemical costs, et cetera. So the goal is, or I guess not the goal, but the point of the cost recovery is the savings that you receive with the reduced water is what is the cost recovery after five to seven years. So you are going to have that additional maintenance cost on a recirculating system but you're gonna have dramatically reduced uh, water costs in relation. Yes, so the cost recovery is the extra costs of the, uh, I'm gonna use the expression miniature water treatment system that you have to have with the recirculating system. Correct. That cost would be recovered by the decreased volume of water. It does not mean that the considerable outlay of money to build and uh, equip this facility is going to be recovered. It's just the additional, additional. Correct. Now, your recommendation the, that's been put forward as a motion um, is, to, is to bring a budget forward. Um, there's some other parameters that I am not sure of, and I think they're very, very important. I know uh, this, we, we, we know each other fairly well, and uh, some of us are very concerned about climate change. I'm one of them, and maybe all this counts as, I don't know, but I am personally very worried about climate change and the, its impact globally and also locally. Um, so we do have a water restriction re regime where we automatically go to level one 
And then I, my understanding then, you know, depends upon certain circumstances, we can move to level two, level three. Um, given what I know and what's been forecast, um, this area is, is better yet it, it's self-organized to deal with frequent periods of drought intersperse with some heavy downfalls. Uh, that beds to a whole bunch of, of issues. But how do communities navigate the operation of splash parts during periods of drought and its interface with water restrictions such as sprinkling water in your lawn, your gardens, or as is happening in some communities in BC now where they've, where they had to shut down their swimming pools uh, because of lack of water and they need to have some residual supply to fight fires. So how, I would like to know in the future, or you may have some answers to that, how the recreational use of water interfaces in the decision making with industry use of water, household use of water. And I'm only talking here around potable. I'm not, we have a wonderful reclaimed water system. I'm dealing just with potable water. Did you have any initial comments about that? So three, Risha, if I could, I'll, and then Chels could maybe add on to that is, so it sounds like you're advocating for a recycling system because What's of the water. It sounds like you're advocating for a research system. Uh, no. <laughs> based that's, on water, that's a, that's, water I'm consumption. I'm not advocating for anything. I'm just concerned about water usage yeah. and, and, and the future, right? So why yeah. spend millions on something that we won't be able to really operate? We'd have to join that hot season, right. which is expanding here. Mm -hmm. And there's some very interesting data in the report about the number of warm days which say, yeah, Cooling off is going to be an increased issue. I accept all that, yeah. but I want to. Yeah, so uh, you spoke about the bylaw, so our water conservation measures bylaw. Um, I believe at stage three is when it speaks to uh, f refilling pools, things like that. Of, um, um, and so we haven't got to stage three for a number of years, um, mainly because of the work that, you know, councils have done about positioning us well for water security. But Chelsea and I were just talking about this, you know, at the break of, you know, we're, we're in a good position. The river is low, um, but our storage is, is doing well for us. But saying that multiple years of low flows in the river certainly could change how we, we manage and operate. Um, the goal of having that storage was to ensure that we could ride out uh, drought periods. And right now, um, we had a very dry summer. We're still in a great position as far as our storage. It didn't affect, um, you know, us in the water usage side in the community. People were still able to, you know, wash their vehicles, were still able to water their lawns every other day without too much of a hiccup. So, um Saying all that, the, the bylaw currently as it sits um, wouldn't come into play. On the flip side, the public, um, as you speak about hot, dry weather, is exactly why they're coming to us and asking for these yeah. things, because they want to be able to recreate, they want to enjoy those, those aspects. Um, you know, when we had the heat dome, we had fire trucks out here blasting water all over the lawn to keep the kids cool. That was not... Um, not the most water conservation minded um, thing, but it but it was great for for the community for that you know that day. Um, so you know again going back to that, that's why I was saying you know the research system, although there's costs, there's maintenance, there's issues that come along with it, um, is going to be a lot. You know if we were ever to get to a point where we had a splash park. Um, if it's a recirculating system and we're experiencing more drought, it's going to be a lot easier to justify the operation of that to the community and beyond because it uses uh, dramatically less water 
than a flow through system. You know, so those are the decisions that council needs to weigh. Um, and I and I appreciate that looking forward. I think you're absolutely right. We don't want to build something that we have to say in two to five years that, geez, we can't, you know, realistically operate it anymore, morally or even functionally because of uh, water restrictions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so my last co last comment, if I may, is that... Uh, in your re in your further in on of this this work, I um, there are certain municipalities that you may want to have a conversation with who've moved away from their splash parts, both flow through and circulating because the high cost of operating, the continued replacement of the equipment to keep the recirculating functioning, the need for staffing, which is gets to be fairly significant. Um, so I, I hope to see all those things reflected in any any budget, because I don't know if my colleagues are getting this, but since in the last couple of weeks I've had a, a lot of conversations and phone calls concerning uh, around the around the tax issue, uh, business formation, possible business collapse. Um, we have this council has increased operating costs with additional staffing and a number of things, and there there's a bit of a groundswell out there about increasing our operating costs and and taxes. Now I take a long term view, but I'm just saying it's out there, and um, we we should uh, maybe listen to what's the previous other municipalities that have gone to certain things, why they went misting over a reclaimed water or over flow through. Um, reclaimed water systems definitely are environmentally more responsible, but they are very expensive from the point of view of replacement of equipment, chemicals, and increased staffing uh, is possible for this, for instance, if you're going to operate it just for the season, you know, for the that window, which hopefully may expand to May to October, I don't know, uh, maybe two, two staff at least. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Parslow. Uh, Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. And uh, with respect to the last point made by my colleague, Councillor Parslow, I am of a, a similar mind. As as um, if, if Council grants uh, the, or votes in favor of the recommendation to continue with the engagement or to finalize the engagement, uh, my hope is that a portion of that engagement emphasizes to the public the costs associated with that and what that looks like in the form of a tax increase. And I think it's what, for every additional $175,000 in spending, that equates to 1%. And I, I'd go back to my first term on council when we were in the midst of discussing before we'd decided Rotary Lake was truly well and done. Uh, one of the things that made continuing to pursue a, a way forward with Rotary Lake prohibitively expensive was the need for uh, the conditions Northern Health laid out had to do with additional full-time staffing on the property that would oversee it and, and a number of things which at that time um, council made the decision that, that it was prohibitive, you know, that the amount it would have added to our operating budget was prohibitively expensive given our financial situation at the time. Um, our financial situation is less dire than it was in 2018, but a poor part of that comes from the fact that we did reduce expenses and we did increase taxes. So it's important for the public to understand, and I've said it before, um, at a municipal level, we can provide whatever service you want at whatever level you'd like it, but it comes at a cost. And we are strategically, we, we've agreed that we're getting out of the business of funding those cost increases through uh, fair share or Peace River Accord money. So um, whatever engagement happens, it needs to be okay if we return with a final budget number of 750 grand a year to operate, whether it's research, whether it's what have you, uh, people understand that's a 5% tax increase or 
or whatever. And I think um, it's important that we have these conversations on the front end because when we don't make that apparent to the public, it becomes very easy for them to go along with or to be in favor of it and very easy for them to pressure us as elected officials to say yes. And then as we're experiencing right now and as we've been challenged with over the last several years, uh, when the bill does inevitably come through, come due, uh, people are concerned about tax increases, as Council Parslow noted. And I'd also note that, yes, we've made some spending decisions, but the vast majority of um, decisions we've made about increasing taxes have been um, to essentially pay for programming and amenities that were onboarded prior to our time that weren't paid for with tax revenue, but out of fair share money at the time. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, given the, the site, uh, stats you cited around increasing temperatures and, and what the future could look like, having a, an outdoor water amenity that's avail available to the public to use um, is important, but it's important that the community be aware of what this costs and what that cost is going to mean to them personally from a tax basis, from a tax standpoint, because if it's free to use, that just increases the, uh, the subsidy by taxpayers. Anyway, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Earl. Said. Um, any other discussion? Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so through your worship, just, um, you know, it, it, again, if, if we move forward with this, I think it's, it's important that we as staff have, have uh, clarity of where council would like to go with it. And what I'm hearing is, uh, at least from a couple of uh, councillors, is that operational expense is, is a top priority to minimize. Because um, that's going to lead into what options that we look at. And, and I think it's important that we have that discussion with anybody we engage so we don't create any false sense of expectation. Um, so saying that, you know, if you want the best of both worlds, it's a misting type of structure because it's going to minimize your water usage and it's going to have minimize your operational expense. And I think if that's something council wants us to explore, we can, but I think we, again, we need to be upfront with the engagement piece. And if we hear from the public that that's not what they want, I want to know that as well, because there's no use us spending a million plus dollars on a structure that nobody I shouldn't say nobody, but that people are not as happy as they could be with. Um, so, you know, again, we've been asked to go down and explore this. That's what council direction was, and that's what we're doing. But I think this is a great check-in to have that further direction um, as well. And then there's the other question about the presentation we saw earlier today about another misting pad looking to be built. How many misting pads do we need in the community? That's the greater question. And I think there's all those pieces that um, we need to be clear about. Um, so that, that, you know, I think if you want to add anything to this, that would be, would be helpful for staff, so. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that too, but um, you know, I think, you know, for myself, it's about getting all the details and all the information laid out so we can make that decision. But I think this council and, you know, staff are all about what's doing what's right for the future of our community. So I think looking at both um, to understand the operational costs, I, you know, if it's not that much more work, um, I think it makes sense to lay it all out um, and to be able to make that decision. And I was going to talk about the presentation we had earlier. I, you know, I know that there's been some dialogue, but clearly we, we probably don't need to. So I think there needs to be some dialogue on, you know, there's a lot of different locations proposed and um, ones that we, you know, might think are better and, and they're looking at one. So, yeah, I, I think we got to work with them, which, you know, I, I believe we have been, right? Um, so, yeah, I agree with, um, you know, everything that's been brought up that we need to look at the, the full picture of everything and... Yeah, I mean, that's what we're doing every day is trying to maximize, you know, our tax dollar usage, right, without increasing it, so, yeah. Um, any other counselors? Before we got, yeah, I, I see that. I'm just going to ask, see if anybody else yeah, wants sure. to speak yeah. first, so. Was there anybody else? No. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Parslow. Well, what, I would just to reflect what you've said, which is where I was going as, as well, I was going to propose an, an, a a. Want to try this? A friendly amendment. 
If, <laughs> so where it re reads, the report number 23-155 from the Community Culture and Recreation Manager, Resplashed Park Development, would it be uh, acceptable to put splash part slash misting part development? I guess I'd have to ask Kevin for clarification, but to me, splash park is the bigger broad picture. Whether that's misting or not would be the same thing, but I don't know if. So through your version, but when, um, when the public hears Splash Park, they think something, I believe, different than yeah. misting. Yes, I do. Definitely. I think, um, uh, I, I do, and I think it, it, it's not bad to have that language in there. I, I mean, I think staff will explore those options regardless, but um, I think it's good to get a sense uh, and some direction from council of what they're thinking and maybe what their desires are, um, because I, I do believe they are two, dis two different things and the, and the public envision them as two different things. Well, if, there's, if it's not accepted as a friendly amendment, I'm going to propose it as an amendment. And, and if someone seconds it, I'd like to speak to it. I think it's, if Tab's fine with that being friendly. Uh, through your worship, might I suggest to Councillor Parslow, instead of changing the title of the report, which is what you were suggesting, perhaps adding it to the end of the motion? A destination with uh, if you've got some suggested words for me, uh, Madam yeah, Corporate the Officer. The <laughs> <laughs> Good suggestion. Well, at the end, it says for a destination splash park slash misting pad. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Darcy. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> I guess one thing too is is just from that presentation we had earlier today, if they're looking at a misting pad and they put that in, there's a cost to us operational as well, right? For that. So I think it's about learning what that is too, whether that makes, yeah. So I don't know if that needs to be added to this report, but I, I think that information is valuable to us, but. So through your worship, I think, um, we definitely need to work with the, with Miles Zero Park Society on this. Again, there's I don't believe there's any point in, in duplicating their efforts. No. Um, the concern I have is that when we've done our work and our research about location, um, it all gravitates to a more of a central location for yeah. mm -hmm. a water feature. And, and, and Miles Zero Park Society is, you know, that isn't really central for the community. So... Um, I guess we can work with them, but they they may be very, um, you know, set on wanting to have one there, and I understand that. But that that's going to be ultimately a decision for council to make about whether they support that or if they wish to only have one um, splash water misting feature in the community and where that is. So, um, what we'll take away from this when all said and done is we will engage with them and, and, and talk about that and then we'll work through that and come back to council with, uh, if need be, on any subsequent uh, direction. Yeah, okay. I think I agree with you too. Like, I mean, the general public is when they think Splash Park, they're thinking something big. And, you know, I think that's where all these details are important because if we're going to do something, you know, we got to do it right. And if, if we, you know, and like Councillor Earl said, educate everybody, like if we're going to do it right and this is what everybody wants, this is what it comes with. Yep. Um, or we do one that's, you know, yeah, not yep, as significant, enough. but it's not what people want, right? So, exactly. Yeah. So thank you. Um, Councillor Parzo, did you have something you wanted to add? Or? Well, it was just reiterating some things. We don't need to. The location, there are many locations that were marked in the map and location should be part of the cons consultation process. Um, and that work will be reflected on the report you, you bring back to us, right? So I'm, I'm comfortable that everything's going to be covered. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And Kevin, you're comfortable? Okay. All right. I will, if there's no more discussion, I will call this motion to vote. Yeah, I think we're adding the misting pad just to the end for a wording. 
uh, everybody was fine with that, right? Yeah. Yes, everybody's fine with that. I uh, will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed and it's carried. All right, um, where is it? Next order of business 8.2. We have report number 23-167 from the Parks and Rec Facility Manager regarding de designated driver program policy. Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Worship. I'll move the recommendation, the report number 23-167 from the Parks and Facilities Manager regarding designated driver policy program be received. Further, that the designated driver policy um, program policy be repealed. I have a second. Councillor Sudnick. Any discussion? All right. I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed and it's carried. Um, next order of business 8.3. We have report number 23-173 from the general manager of operations regarding a request to amend the city's snow plowing and removal policy maps. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll move the recommendation that report number 23-173 from the general manager of operations regarding request to amend the city's snow plowing and removal policy maps be received. Further, that council amend the road priority snow plowing map and the sidewalk snow plowing map to include a section of 100th Avenue between 14th and 15th Street to accommodate the change in bus route around No Frills parking, uh, parking shopping complex and include the new multi-use path along 95th Avenue between 13th and 17th Street. Do I have a second? Thanks, Councillor Earl. Uh, Councillor Kempf, any discussion? You're good, Councillor Earl. Okay. All right, I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed. It's carried. Um... Next order of business was 8.4. We have report number 23-174 from the General Manager of Development Services regarding reclaimed water pipeline cost and feasibility. Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Worship. I'll move the recommendation in the report number 23-174 from the General Manager of Development Services regarding reclaimed water pipeline cost and feasibility be received for information. Uh, thank you, Councilor Kemp. Do I have a second? Councilor Earl. Councilor Earl. Discussion? Thank you, Worship, and thank you to staff for the report and the uh, look under the hood. A little rich for my blood. Um, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Other discussion? No. All right, I will call this motion to vote. <coughs> vote is closed. It's carried. Uh, oh, did you? No, I voted. I voted on this, but I, I want to ask a question of on this on this whole topic of the golf course and water. I think it's related. Okay. Yeah. Is that so, fine? So yeah. I'm I'm glad we did do the uh, research on this, um, but I do have a question. Um, I previously stated that uh, the, um, we were, I would ask him whether we should, as a council, be encouraging the golf course um, manager to explore the options of drawing water from the creek at spring runoff. Is staff aware of, of any activity in that front? And if not, could the staff um, jolt this, the uh, golf manager to explore that yeah you can go ahead Kevin. Yeah. so through your worship my understanding in discussions with the golf course is that they do have a permit to withdraw during certain periods of time for shed and whatnot to um, to do that so that's something they had already undertaken some time ago Good. thank you thank you um, all right uh, next order of business 8.5 we have report uh, number 23-175 from the corporate, corporate officer regarding policy amendments alignment with public notice bylaw. Councillor Kemp. 
Thank you, Worship. I'll move the recommendation, the report number 23-175 from the corporate officer regarding policy and amendments, alignment with public notice bylaw be received, for that the following policies be amended to align with the public notice bylaw. One, annual closure of non-essential city facilities. Two, bylaw enforcement guidelines. Three, cannabis and liquor license applications. Four, hiring guidelines for hiring. Five, hiring, hiring of staff. Six, permissive tax exemption. Seven, walkways. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Do I have a second? Councillor Apollonio, any discussion? Well, I will call this motion to vote. Vote is closed. It's carried. Uh, next order of business is nine bylaws, 9.1 council procedure amendment bylaw number 4574, 2023 for consideration of adoption. Councillor, Councillor um, Parslow, sorry, second. Councillor Earl. Um, Councillor Parslow, you wanted to speak? Oh. Did Councillor Earl move it? He seconded you. Oh moved yeah. It. No, I have nothing to say. Okay. It's clear, quite clear. Okay. I will move this motion to vote. The vote is closed. It's carried. Uh, next order of business 9.2. We have report number 23-176 from the city planner regarding a referral comments for zoning amendment 23-06 bylaw number 4573-2023 for consideration of third reading and adoption. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Worship. I'll move the recommendation that report number 23-176 from the city planner regarding zoning amendment 23-06 bylaw number 4573-2023 be received. Further, that zoning amendment 23-06 bylaw number 4573-2023 be given third reading and adopted. Thanks, Councillor Earl. I have a second, Councillor Kemp. Any discussion? I'll move that motion to vote. Vote is closed and it's carried. It's carried. I am just going to call a five minute break. So, to order. so next order of business was 10 mayor's business, uh, 10.1 mayor's updates. So uh, first I just want to start off. I had um, homeschooling uh, students in here. I think there was, well, there was 30 students in here and parents. So, uh, it was it was an amazing um, morning actually or afternoon I got to spend with them and uh, had them in give them a tour of the city but then had them in council chambers and set them up as like mayor and council and delegates and staff and um, the gallery and had them walk through the whole process and you know just to teach them about municipal politics so we did that for you know about an hour which was amazing some of the uh, the comments and the delegations were just, you know, absolutely amazing. And then uh, just had questions and just had some real roundtable discussions uh, with them for, you know, an hour or whatever that was. And uh, yeah, it was definitely a highlight. It was um, extremely uh, powerful for myself um, just to be with those youth, but also uh, I, I believe the youth had a lot of value out of it as well. They just, they asked a lot of real questions. Um, there was a very diverse age group. And yeah, it was just extremely fun, but in inspiring uh, for myself just to see the youth engaged and, and the homeschooling community is a, is a lot larger than I ever knew. I, I think it's well over 200 students. I think it's actually close to 300 um, from what I remember. I'm getting the nod, so I think it was 300 that was mentioned. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it, it was just excellent. And I definitely hope to do more of those because um, I really think it, it helps um, our future really with dealing with the youth and inspiring them. So it was amazing. Uh, next, the Christmas tree light up. Um, uh, we had that uh, last Friday. What a, an absolutely amazing day weather-wise. I think it was plus eight um, standing up there. It was so warm, but um, how many people? I, I think there was like, there had to be a couple thousand people. And I got up on the stage as far down um, south of the tree as I could see. It was almost right to the next set of lights, was jammed with um, people. Um, and then going both other directions. So just absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I, I wanted to give a huge thank you to the Rotary Clubs, uh, to the South Peace Oilmen's. Um, 
uh, SI Oil Field Hauling, PC Oil Field, Denali Energy Services, Tryon Professional Group, um, and Longhorn Rentals. Um, just absolutely amazing all the work and effort that goes into that, um, uh, you know, t- to really just to better our community, bring people together, um, you know, and just amazing. Uh, so a huge thank you to them and everybody that was involved. I'd also like to recognize that this was a pretty special year as Steve um, Matthews, um, who recently passed away, was instrumental in starting the, uh, this great tradition um, and a big part annually volunteering for many years. Um, so they, they dedicated this year's tree to Steve, but uh, I just wanted to touch on it again. Steve was a, you know, a and an amazing community member that always gave back, and, and this was a big part of him. Uh, he'd definitely be greatly missed, but it, you know, it, it's an honor to see that his legacy will live on through this. And they, they did add a plaque uh, to the base of the tree, and they also mentioned that they're going to um, next year clean the base up and um, you know, and put a permanent plaque on. So, um, and then that tree, as I talked with some of the oil men's and Kevin is. Just, probably the biggest tree we've ever seen. So I wanted to, you know, give a thank you to the Borbo family, but um, what a big, beautiful, full tree. So um, I just wanted to give a shout out to them. And then, uh, yeah, just such an amazing event that, you know, truly showcases how great our community is. Uh, The real win was bringing everybody together and to celebrate and just to embrace the strength of a community. Um, just to see that many youth and families together in one area, and there was all sorts of activities going on. Um, it, it was really uh, just, it, it was just great to see. So, so um, I just wanted to mention that. So, thank you. Um, next, the South Peace Oilman's Bearware Silent Auction. I attended that it was last Saturday. Um, you know, uh, Paul and Sharon Javetkoff uh, organized this, and uh, you know I could have mentioned them in the last one because they're a huge part of the South Peace Oilmans. Uh, Paul was one of the original uh, founders of it, and to, to hear the I heard the story about it actually at the last year's Lobster Fest on how it was started, and it uh, it was, just blew me away because I didn't know uh, how many years, and that you know Paul was initially part of that, but um, anyways, uh, Paul and Sharon organized this um, the Bearware Silent Auction up at the Ski Hill. Uh, this year, which was last Saturday. So uh, I think they had almost 60 attendants, but it was, I can't remember, and Sharon will probably get mad at me for not remembering how many years it's been, uh, but it's been a lot of years that they've been doing this, and it was the most successful year. Um, so it was just amazing to see after that many years um, th- that the strength that it's getting and, and growing. Um, and really just to see the ski hill. I was um, have been up there you know, my whole life, but really since Paul has been in there and Sharon and just to see the changes of the, the ski hill over the last 10 or so years, uh, it's just amazing to see. So I um, just wanted to give a shout out to them and our community for supporting the function. Um, I had a meeting with Kendra Kiss, um, who is with Northern Health and the nursing department uh, last week, I think, or the week before. They're all kind of a blur right now, but... Um, uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Kendra. I, we're very lucky to have um, you know somebody like Kendra in our community and um, leading our nursing department. Uh, it, it was more just an update, really, where we're at. Um, you know, some of their concerns, the good things. Um, yeah, uh, it, you know, and just to, to really take this time to give a huge thank you to all the medical staff, um, nurses, the whole team at the hospital, and all. Uh, the medical field. Um, there's shortages like every other field. Um, and, you know, these um, folks, they, they got to put a lot of extra in all the time and they get a lot of stress and pressure and uh, not always dealing with um, exciting things. So I, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to them and a thank you for what they do every day um, and to Kendra for just taking the time to come in and, and, and sh- share with me as well. So. Um, five strategic planning we had uh, last week, uh, council and city staff, leadership team, um, kind of went through our strategic plan planning uh, that we did up earlier this year and action planned it. So just kind of went through high level um, kind of goals where we see things going. Uh, so I just wanted to touch on that a little bit and, you know, thank everybody that was for part, that was part of that. Um, and, and you know, and also a big thank you to the to the lady that helped us um, facilitate it. 
Uh, and then the next step will be that uh, this goes to the the leadership team of the city, um, which I believe they're they're doing shortly, and they're going to you know take those goals and then bring it back to council. So we look forward to that and, and to moving forward with it. Um, next youth roundtable, we had that the same week actually as the U eighteen hockey. Um, so th that's an, another one of the roundtables that have been doing. Um, this one's. Um, youth leaders in the community, so different organizations. Um, it's getting a lot of a lot of traction. There's a lot of people that want to join it, and it's very um, been very good. There's been some good stuff that come out of it. Um, one of the big things that's came out of it is is the desire to do uh, some sort of youth expo in our community. So something where we can do something to. Um, honor, not honor youth, but just show youth what, what the community has to offer and um, from every level, from sports to mental health to, to every kind of school programs, the city programs, all of it. So that is um, something that has come of it. Um, it's just kind of in the initial planning stages and I hope I didn't throw that out there too soon. Um, there's another meeting in the next couple of weeks, but that's kind of the one, I guess, dream and vision that's coming from it. Um, which was organically brought up in the meeting too. It was, uh, it, it was, yeah, it, it's been pretty neat to be part of and see and just hear everything that's going on. There's so many that give back to youth in this community. So I'm excited to see where that goes. So uh, the next Doss Creek Athletics Association had their AGM, uh, which was last Friday, two Fridays ago. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a huge shout out to the Dawson Creek Athletics Association for what they do in our community. But also I think it was the 92nd annual meeting. So it, it's crazy to, to hear the history and see it that they've been around for 92 years. Um, so I just wanted to give a you know shout out to them for inviting uh, myself up there, but also just to their board of directors and their volunteers that um, give back and what they do. Uh, I also annually they do awards, so they do. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about those. They do the Brian McPherson Memorial Award, uh, which is um, given to a business that creates or that s supports and sponsors youth sports in the community. So this year's recipient was uh, Jacobson Construction, Bill Jacobson. So uh, that was amazing to see. Bill is um, you know been a a, you know, an asset to our business community for a lot of years and our community. So it was nice to see that. Uh, the other award was the Earl Johnson Memorial Award, um, coach, uh, which went to Rick Hackworth, you know, a, another, um, you know, amazing person in our community that's given back so much to youth sports. So that was amazing. And then the Sam Wilson Award for a team or individual um, person. And this was awarded to Rob Powell, um, Rob is uh, my age. I went to school with Rob, so I've known him my whole life. But um, Rob is definitely an athlete at heart and a natural athlete. No matter what he does, he is he excels at. But um, I, I've, assuming this was for his uh, recent um, uh, end of our into golf, he's always been a great golfer. But this last couple of years, he's been a lot more competitive and and doing very well at it in, in the region. So. Yeah, so I just wanted to recognize those three individuals and, and, and thank the Dawson Creek Athletics Association. Uh, next, Trombley School, I had um, uh, on Remembrance Day ceremony, I had uh, the opportunity, I was asked to come to Trombley School to do their Remembrance Day ceremony and be part of it. And uh, while I was there, um, there was a you know an emergency act that was required by the RCMP. Um, so I happened to be in the school when this took place, and um, I I just got to put my hat off to the school district, but also the students um, in how serious they took things. I was in the middle of there was five um, students that were running this um, the the ceremony, so I was up there introducing myself, and something came over the PA mm -hmm. system, and they just stopped like looking at me, and you know, they were listening, and then they all left, and I didn't know really what was going on, but um, it, yeah, it, that's what it was. It was their emergency broadcast that they needed to um, put the school in lockdown. So it was just it was amazing to see how well the kids um, responded to that, and then I was in. Um, in a room with them in the gym uh, with one of the young class. So yeah, I just wanted to give a, you know, just really a shout out to them. I was, I think we were in there almost an hour in that room. And, you know, for anybody to sit in one room for an hour is hard, let alone, you know, five and six and seven year olds. So they, it was just amazing how, um, 
Yeah, how uh, well, I, I never would have thought that the school system actually had that, those systems in place. So to see it firsthand and to be part of it, I was, um, you know, besides the circumstances as why it was, it was going on, uh, it was it was great to be part of and see the school. So, um, and then they did invite me back for the Remembrance Day ceremonies for next year. So, well, um, next the smile cookie decorating. Um, I just wanted to uh, on the Friday of the U18. I didn't touch on the U18 because I did that last um, mayor's updates, but. I just wanted to give a little shout out to um, uh, Jillian and Kyle from Tim Hortons. They, um, on the Friday of the event, we helped decorate a thousand smile cookies that they gave out um, for the silver, the bronze and gold medal games uh, that were sponsored. So, um, you know, I, I know Kyle s sits on uh, on council, so I have a tough time bringing this up sometimes, but. Uh, Jillian and her team, what they do for our community is absolutely amazing. And um, just to see them down there and, um, and their leadership team down there and, and working with them um, really shows that they're just all about community. So um, I just wanted to thank them for that. Um, and I do have a couple more. We're a little, talking a little bit too much here. So um, next, uh, Carrie Reed. Uh, Kevin and myself met with Carrie Reed um, from Loyal page um, in the last couple of weeks as well. And, and this was just a lot of discussion around um, the short-term rental policies that have been put in place by the provincial government and these zoning amendment um, bylaws. So uh, Kevin has been, you know, looking into this a lot and getting a lot of research. There's a lot of new information coming out, but, um, you know, just after that meeting and then Kevin and myself talking, we, um, we're feeling that we need some direction from council on um, writing a letter. So I do have, uh, do you want me to make a motion now? Tab, I did have a couple more things I wanted to talk about or do you want me to do it when I'm done talking? When I'm done? Okay, so I'll jump back to that when I'm done. So um, next on Friday, I had a business round table um, with some bus local business owners in the community. There was, uh, I think seven or eight. So um, I, I just wanted to touch a little bit on some of the concerns that they brought up because um, some of them we've been working on and some they're asking for some directions. So uh, I'm definitely going to research them and bring something back. But some of their big concerns were um, the temporary OPS site. Um, Northern Health has put out some you know, more flyers, just very clear that it's a temporary. And there's just some concerns still in our business community about, about that wording temporary. Um, I explained to them that um, you know our letters and our dialogue with the Minister of Health was, um, you know, if it's something that we need in our community and we have to have it, that it, we would prefer it on the hospital um, property. And Kevin and myself had a lot of dialogue around that uh, and we stand behind that. So, um, you know, I think there's been some success of it being there. Um, and I don't know what Northern Health's plan is if it is to move, but it, it is something that we've expressed to them that, you know, we feel that if it has to be here, it needs to be in the hospital. So I just wanted to get that out there. Um, you know, also there's a lot of comments just about, um, you know, the cleanliness, um, downtown in the community of, you know, whether it's been bins that are going through or, um, you know, we've seen it at ATMs, um, you know, just some of the mess that's being left behind downtown and, um, you know, just really wanting, um, you know, um, the city, I guess, to, to show that, you know, we're standing behind this and, and that we're trying to do something with the cleanliness. And I, I really believe we are. I mean, we're open to suggestions and things we can do. Um, we're trying, we've advocated at all levels of government that we can. And, um, and not only for, you know, the homeless crisis, but on both ends, like some of that imp impacts, you know, everybody. So it's like, how do we um, do this together? But one of the things was, is, you know, if we could lobby to find funding to help this, right? And I, I think that's maybe something we can look into is, you know, whether that's assisting businesses that are constantly having to re-clean up or, you know, even at our city level, um, we've there's a lot that Kevin and the team have to deal with daily around this uh, mental health and wellness and um, the cleanliness. So, you know, that was something uh, that was brought up. Um, 
you know, and then also obviously some of the, you know, the recent activities that we've had um, in, in the community with um, the law and, you know, with the, the criminal code and system and, you know, maybe putting something together, um, fed, you know, to our federal um, government on, you know, these are the issues we're, we're facing and we have faced. Um, and this is what some of the, you know, um, the policies that are in place have led to this that, you know, our RCMP and our local community are having to deal with. And um, so, yeah, I just really wanted to bring those up. And um, yeah, I know we've been dealing with this for a year and a half, uh, pretty much since we've all been sitting here. Um, and it's, you know, it hasn't gone away. I think there's been some wins here and there. And, you know, I don't think we're stepping back. I mean, uh, there was talk about the RCMP, and uh, we'll get to that later. But I, I mean, I, I I stand behind our RCMP and and what they're doing every day. It, it's unbelievable what they have, they have been doing and what they get put through. So, um, but yeah, that, that those were kind of just some of the bigger points. So uh, I, I mean, going to continue to keep pushing forward on on any direction I've had from council, but also here to you know if there's something else you guys want to see or learn from that, then just let me know. Um, another thing was, is just, um, you know, there's a perception a bit in the community that the city's not doing a lot. So, um, you know, that's sometimes perception is reality. So I, I am, and that's what I need to accept is that, um, th that's fine. Um, people have that perception and I'm listening to myself, um, and Kevin have talked a lot about like, how do we, you know, maybe be a little bit more, um, out in the community about things that we're doing. So um, something that we've talked about having a communications person and, you know, the mayor's office page. So we're just going to get a little bit more active and we have been, um, but just something that we're going to focus on more so. So, um, And then with that, I did have a motion that I, I did, did want to put forward. Um, and then I'll just, after that, I'll see if there's any questions. But I'd like to just make a motion um, for council to direct staff to draft a letter for the mayor's signature to the premier in response to the recent housing legislation changes provo proposed by the province. So I'll make the motion. If somebody can second it, I'll speak a bit to it. So, Councillor Earl, um, really, this is just in regards to the um, short-term housing um, policies that have been put forward and to the zoning amendments. Um, just once Kevin and myself can learn more. Uh, we just wanted the motion ahead of time that we can just put a letter forward to, you know, the premier and the ministers um, involved just on some of the challenges that, that we believe this is going to bring to our community, whether it's infrastructure or um, the zoning uh, requirements or you know, tying our hands a little bit as a council, what we're allowed to do. So, um, yeah, so I don't know if you have any questions in regards to this motion. Um, Councillor Earl. Thank you. So just so I understand it, we're talking about a couple different policies that have been announced through the Ministry of Housing in the last few weeks around short-term rentals, so Airbnb, yeah, and then the zoning piece, and then there was a third one. Announced. Well, those are the two major two chief. ones, and then I, I think our, you know, we were trying to get some details on what to propose in the letter right now, but problem yeah. is it's also new and it's there's so much yeah. learning going well, on. Well, it's, it's, it's announcing legislation and actually putting meat on the, the bones is a different thing. I mean, I guess my thrust would be, you know, undeniably, if you spend any time in the lower mainland and you see, you know, an entire generation priced out of the housing market, it's undeniable there is a crisis there where 75, 80% of the province lives. Uh, having said that, uh, while we have challenges here in Dawson Creek, the, the initiatives they're proposing to address the problems and challenges in the lower mainland aren't necessarily a good fit for us. And, yeah. and I appreciate, you know, policy doesn't account for every single um, instance, but this is one of those things where it's, it's definitely a, a tale of two regions or two provinces, uh, rural and urban. And yeah, it's, it's just not not the best fit for us. I don't know if, if the advocacy goes towards some carve-outs for rural jurisdictions or, you know, something that would encapsulate, take into to account the fact that we're in a very, very different situation with respect to the average price of someone's first home here versus 
Burnaby or uh, Coquitlam. So, so I, you know, that's, I think, all you can do. So just to be clear, and we're CCing, uh, I guess, Ravi Kalan is the Minister of Housing and uh, the local MLA as well? I would, yeah, I would think all levels that are, that are involved with okay. this. Okay, yeah, no, I'm in support of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parslow? Yes, I, I'm a huge supporter of uh, both yourself and uh, our staff. But I just wondered if we wouldn't be better if we, um, in the future, if we actually could look at the draft, because I think there's a number of issues. I've read that legislation. I've actually met with Carrie Reed, right? And um, I, I think there's uh, quite a bit more in the concern. But right now, it's a, it's, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity to provide input. I'm all in favor of that, right? But um, I just think it might be in the future good if we could look, send a draft out yeah. so that we all support it or, the, or there may be some things. Because one thing I haven't heard that concerns me, and I may be off base here, so just rein me in. Um, one of the things that concerns me, and I didn't hear you or... Jeremy uh, made mention of it, is basically the insertion of um, multi sitzplexes or p possibility four plexes into an RS1, as an example. And in, that, in other words, the actual, um, well, real gerrymandering of the zoning uh, pattern as captured in our official community plan. Now, if, if my interpretation is correct, I would vehemently would want some objection voiced about that. Yeah. But I, you know what I mean? So, I, you know, a huge support of you two. And I have great confidence, but I wouldn't mind, I think as a practice, if, if time permits it, seeing a draft, right, and then we do a telephone then we, uh, yeah, we're, we're fine with that. Or you guys, what about this? That's yeah. all I'm suggesting. Yeah, no, and uh, that's what I was touching on, just about like tying our hands a little bit as the councils because of, you know, that policy on bringing multi, you know, dwellings, yeah. right? And, yeah. and also the the, um, the pressure that could put on our infrastructure if it's not set for it. But yeah, but yeah I think this was a little bit of a timing thing. It's something that we feel yeah, like sure. we need to get there. But I don't have a problem once we have something drafted, we could send it out to, to council. Yeah. Just in case we miss something too, so yep. yeah. I don't know if you uh, want to add so through your worship, I'm just going to add. So what we know right now is that with the short-term legislation, uh, there is a threshold of three percent vacancy rates um, for any community that has uh, vacancy rates lower than that. Then they are mandatorily um, obliged to be part of the short-term legislation. If you have vacancy rates. Higher than that, which we do. Um, we did some research over the last week. CMHC has us, I think, at like 5.8, 5.9% vacancy. So we have an ability to opt out of that legislation. That's still to be determined what that looks like, how that'll happen. And as when we get more clarity on how we do that, then we'll come to council with a direction uh, or seek direction uh, of what council would like to do there. Um, so I think for now that that will be an option for us and um, we'll resolve some of those uh, short-term rental issues if council wishes to go that way. Um, but saying that if our vacancy rates change, then we're automatically in. So those are things we're going to have to monitor and yeah. kind of be fluid with as we go forward. Um, and as the mayor said and Councillor Parzal, yes, the zoning issues, the the proposed changes to zoning um, definitely have concerns. Um, densification, parking, infrastructure, bylaw issues, uh, all those aspects become, um, we know what even a scaled down version of that looks like. We experienced it over the last five to seven years in some of our developments with even lower densities than what they're proposing. And we know there's challenges. So. Um, again, here in December, I think we're supposed to get more of a technical document that's going to 
illustrate how some of this will be implemented in the more specifics. Um, I suspect when once we get that, then we'll bring some more information to council, whether that's in a committee of the whole or whatever that looks like, to to make sure everybody understands what maybe what we're up against. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Any other discussion on that? No. Okay. All right. I will call that motion to vote. Or were you wanting to discuss it, Councillor President? Oh, okay. Vote is closed and it's carried. Um, I am actually just going to take like a one minute break and then we're going to go back on the agenda. Back so. to order. Um, so I'm just going to go back on the agenda to 2.5. We have Miss Tammy Maznick and Miss Kelly Little, um, addictions program teacher in attendance regarding sober living homes in Dawson Creek. So welcome Tammy and Kelly. Thank you for joining us. So you just got to push that button on the middle there and then I will turn it on. There you go, welcome, and the floor is all yours. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you, good morning. Um, we created a society called Peace, Serenity, Wellness Society, and um, our vision is to create sober living houses in Dawson Creek. Um, the point of the houses is to empower and nurture um, individuals that are struggling with addictions, but more of like, bridging that gap between um, treatment, like going to residential, and then also joining back into community or their home environment. So it's um, continuing to build on the skills that they've learned in treatment and before going home, because going home can be really, really scary for individuals, right? They um, have uh, relationships that they need to rebuild, they have um, home environments that maybe need to uh, become differently. And we find that people coming from treatment centers and then going home, um, their, their relapse is a lot higher. And if they had something in between where they could maybe possibly change their home environment, um, rebuild those relationships before heading home, that their recovery would be more successful. So that's kind of what we're trying to, to build in Dawson Creek. Um, our homes would be <clears throat> like a four to a six bedroom house. And the whole purpose of having people there is to be peer led, right? So not only will they have skilled workers and counselors um, that come into the home, but they will, it'll also be with peer-led people. Like people with lived and living experience will also be helping um, create the environment there. Um, it, it's actually gonna be a lot more strict um, than some of the other homes. We looked into homes like down in Vancouver just to kind of like base what we would want our homes to look like. And they would be, there would be very strict rules where they would, like, there, there would be no using. The people that are coming into, into the homes would be um, wanting to continue on their recovering journey. And, they, and, and that's what we'd be helping them with. Not saying that coming into the homes, they wouldn't be homeless. They might not be um, right directly from Dawson Creek. It could be surrounding, like it could be Farmington, something like that. And, but that's where we're hoping to bridge that gap is to find them housing, like suitable housing for themselves or um, if they need job skills or, you know, re-skills re for, you know, going back out into um, our economy and, and working and stuff. And if that's what they need, then that's what we're going to find them. Or if they need, you know, if they want to go back to the college and do some college courses, that's, that's kind of where we want to, to try and get them. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I will open it up to council first for questions and then Councillor Parslow. So is this a pilot pro program for Northern Health or does it, is it building on an existing programs in the Northern Health region? So we're not affiliated with Northern Health. We, oh, yeah. okay. Um, this was just a vision that me and Kelly both had. We, we love working in addictions. We've, we, many of our skills are in addictions. Um, and uh, we applied for like a federal 
government funding and that was one of one of the reasons why we had first come to about a month ago and yeah in in the letter everybody got everything mixed up because we put yeah well what it reads in front of me is tammy mazanek and kelly little are both employed by we're, northern we're, health yes. as addictions program teachers mm -hmm. So do you want to tr 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 set the record straight? <laughs> so we are not affiliated with Northern Health um, with this housing, the, with this project. Tammy and I met, she's a therapist. She was doing her master's in counseling. Yes. And I met her when I was employed at Northwinds at the treatment center. Okay, yeah. And we're both very passionate about recovery. And I've seen continually people come through programs and there's no aftercare. It's that gap. There's, so they, they go home and there's not that much support. Yeah. So we see it continually. People um, go back home and they, you know, relapse. They don't have success. So mm -hmm. we just are passionate. We want to um, give them extra from three to six months um, where they continue to work on their life skills, um, learn, maybe go back to school, um, whatever it might be to help them um, give them more support in their right. recovery. Yeah, well, conceptually, it makes absolute sense. Um, so it's not my personal experience, but supporting different agencies, I know that this makes a lot of sense. So do you have a home selected for this, or what's, where are you at with this project? <laughs> kind of. Um, uh, yes. We have one home that we're hoping to start in in April. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and we're kind of just at the funding point of um, building on this project. Right. Okay, so just a question if I may to staff. Yeah. Uh, is there, are there zoning uh, issues that need to be navigated for such a program as this, uh, staff? So through your worship, um, without additional information, I would say no. There, there are a number of similar type of um, residences in the community. And I, I, like I'll think of the Mitzpah house or things like that where you have, you know, so I'm, my initial thing is, is no, but barring any other information. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Councillor Parzlow. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you to both of you for coming in and speaking with us. I was initially the one uh, who raised the point that I was, there was some ambiguity around, um, and, and not on you, just we've had uh, conversations in the past with Northern Health, um, and we didn't know we were talking with corporate or someone representing a specific department out of, say, Fort St. John or something. So thank you for the clarification. Um, so the a uh, couple questions, I guess. Uh, have you to this point secured any funding? No? No. Okay. Uh, and the letter you are seeking from us, would that be for a specific grant or just kind of an open-ended general letter indicating we're in support of the this initiative in principle? Um, just just a generic letter supporting that, our, our, like our vision and our um, okay. initiative to open up houses. Um, we we are going to like forward it to the funding that we already applied for here in November. Okay, um, and and I mean I, I apologize if I'm I'm veering outside your area of expertise, but you know it's it's an interesting question when we, we're dealing with uh, sober living or or any kind of of rehab housing uh, about what the need is or what the deficit is in our community. Um, I mean, we know there is one, but how many units are needed and, and you know, are they, I guess, being uh, utilized pr first and foremost for local, to the benefit of local residents? Mm -hmm. And is that in your vision for, for where you'd like to be in, say, five years, do you have a, a number in mind? And What we're hoping to do first initially is open up a woman's um, sober living house. And then from there, um, eventually opening up uh, um, like a male, a man's. Um, what we do know is that women have more services than men do. Like men have way less services when it comes to 
like rehabilitation and sober living housing mm -hmm. areas. So I think that even if uh, whatever currently is is happening in Dawson Creek, um, that we would mm -hmm. build on that. Okay, cool. Thank you both for your time once again. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Earl. Any other questions? Um, I had I didn't actually have any questions. I I, I wanted to. Th Thank you for coming in, but I also wanted to thank you for taking this initiative and um, putting a solution forward into our community that um, helps. Because I, um, you know, I get it. Understand that there's a lot of struggles in our community around um, mental health and addiction. So for you to see that in your everyday life, thank you for dealing with that. Uh, but also thank you for looking outside the box and, and what can actually help people and and to get them to a better place in society and life. So, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to say thank you to both of you, and uh, I appreciate you coming in. And um, you did have a letter, so usually we deal with this later in Mayor's Business, but there is a, a correspondence. So um, after this, we'll um, deal with the request and, and go from there. So. Okay, wonderful. Perfect. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, our next order of business will be 7.1, email from Tammy Masnick and Kelly Little, Addictions Program Teachers, um, sent on November 2nd, 2023, regarding a request for a letter of support regarding a sober living home in Dawson Creek. Uh, this was deferred, so the motion's actually already on the table. So um, was the original motion... Kyle was the original. What was it? Was the original motion just to defer it, or was there a motion to um, to send a letter of support? Through your worship, there is a motion on the floor, and the motion is that the email from Tammy Mazanek and Kelly Little Addictions Program teachers, November second, twenty twenty three, request for letter of support regarding sober living homes in Dawson Creek be approved. Okay. And that was moved by Councillor McDonald and seconded by Councillor Kempf. Okay, so we have the motion on the floor. Is there any discussion on the motion? No. All right, I will call this motion to vote. The vote is closed uh, and it's carried. All right, um, I'm jumping around on my agendas here, so I need to find. Um, so our next order of business, well, back to mayor's uh, business. So um, 10.2, we had um, delegation request from Kathy Peters to send a letter of support to the Federal Minister of Justice, CC Premier David Eby, um, Mike Farnsworth, and Nikki Sharma, Attorney General, and um, yeah. Uh, that was one of the requests, so I guess we could deal with that request first. Um, and then there was also somebody else named um, in her presentation, but we can probably go back and get the wording from that. Okay. Uh, so did somebody want to... Councillor Parslow? Councillor Parslow? Yes. Um, I certainly... Uh, what a, a presentation resonated with me. Um, so, I, yeah, I have no... Uh, uh, I'd like to see, in addition to writing a letter, as this request of... Um, the letter, presumably, is going to address the legalization of prostitution. Is that what the letter is going to be addressing? Um, or the, or is it the enforcement of existing of legislation? I'm a little yeah. confused. So, can can the specifics be listed? Tab, through you? your worship, to Councillor Parslow, the letter was requesting that the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act be enforced to those persons that. Uh, Mayor Dober indicated. Okay. So move then. Thank you. So Councillor Parzel will move that motion. Second, Councillor Kempf. Any discussion? No. I will call that motion to vote. 
Vote is closed. It's carried. And then her next ask was um, for us to send other agencies in Dawson Creek. So is that even something we need a motion for? I mean, it's easy enough to send like the Chamber of Commerce, but I don't know school district. But I like is that something we could just send her a list, or do we even is that even something we can do? Kevin, what are your thoughts on that? Like. She was asking for other agencies in Dawson Creek that she could present to. Because we could get, I mean, there's just so many, like is that Rotary School District, Dawson Creek Chamber of Commerce? So through your worship, what I might suggest is that uh, you would reach out to a, a few of those and mention that you had a presentation here. You think there's maybe some value if you want and then um, see if they'd be interested and then you could provide that information. I wouldn't do it without having that conversation. Okay. So we don't need a motion then for, uh, okay. All right. Um, the next, uh, oh, sorry, Councilor Parslow. <laughs> I didn't see your light on. Uh, just uh, related to this, you could push your button. This presentation, um, mm. I don't know how the rest of council feels, but I, I'm very interested in the uh, uh, finding out why the, the I, I think the assertion was let me step back the assertion was that the provincial government is uh, pushing the legalization of prostitution and that with that comes organized gang stuff drugs and the whole thing um, if that assertion is correct, then that really concerns me. But it, I would, I'm kind of uh, interested why, finding out why the provincial government is is pushing that. Looking down that yeah. avenue. Uh, because that, if that <laughs> assertion is correct, that, that concerns me, right? So would you like to put a motion forward that we maybe write a letter to those to find out, one, if this is accurate and to what their reasoning is? Or what are your... No, I don't want to burden stuff. I think I'll ask my MLA, our okay. MLA, if he can dig into that for us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let uh, us know. It just that. strikes me as something I've never heard of. Yeah. I usually try to keep up on what's going on politically. Yeah, I'm the same, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Parzel. Um, all right, uh, the next was a delegation request from uh, next was from the Miles Real Park Society. So we had a couple asks there. One um, for the 2024 budget, uh, the water line, and then the second was letter of support for the pump track. So that wasn't asked no. that by them, yeah. Uh, maybe on their letter, but yeah, I think that'll get dealt with. Yeah. Um, so, Councillor Earl? Uh, do you need me to move these separately for the sake of cleanliness tab? I would think that okay. how different they, are, uh, they need to be separate. Then I will uh, move the uh, uh, resolution to provide them with permission to move forward with building the pump track. Like a letter of support? Well, they ask permission. Yes, permission. Ask yeah. for permission. permission. Yeah. So I guess that's dependent upon permitting as well. But this is just us yeah. saying yeah, so through your politically worship. we're fine with it. Exactly. This is your property, and uh, it is appropriate for them to get formal permission to move forward with a project on your property. Um, if I were them, I would want that. So. Um, there's a bunch of other things that have to occur with the project. You're not a, yeah. you know, approving a carte blanche, but what you're saying is that you're okay with them moving forward, and as long as they um, meet all the other requirements that will come along with it, whether you know, like council indicated permitting and otherwise. So, um, okay. So would this be different then? Because when they were in here, I asked there were two asks before they left. One was a letter of support, which I'm assuming they're going to need for these grants and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and then their uh, their second ask was the. For the water. Yeah, so I think we can so are, we can draft a letter that really hits that and yeah. says that you know we 
we approve, we authorize, and, uh, moving support. forward, and it's, we support it. However, we'll, we'll leave that up to uh, the ones who are good at crafting those letters, but we can hit those points Kay. for sure. Perfect. So, Councillor Earl, motion. Move. You're going to move that? Yes. I'll yeah. Move that. Second. Councillor Sudnick, discussion. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship, once again. Um, always wonderful to have a chat with, with folks working so hard to make the most of the city's amenities and uh, adding... Um, through a pump track, a unique amenity to the city that will uh, hopefully uh, f fulfill the needs of an entirely new and different demographic. And uh, that's wonderful to see. Thanks, Councillor Earl. Any other discussion? Councillor Parslow? Well, just a, a friendly amendment. Can we add to that the request to, for permission to remove trees that would need to be taken down to build this place? It's, it's one of their asks. Um, does that need to be... Well, so three would that be something might, they'll work with staff on, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's my understanding that um, they needed to remove some trees. Um, our policy, I believe, is that we don't remove trees unless they are unhealthy. Um, so I, again, I think it is it appropriate for them to ask for permission because it will be a waiving of policy if indeed these trees are technically healthy uh, to be removed. So I, I, I think it would be cleaner if um, there was part of the motion spoke to the fact that um, council was okay with waiving policy to remove um, any trees that were determined um, we're in the way of the pump track, however that wording would go, um, and they'd work with staff to, to determine that. So to clarify, you would, we would need to do that separately, I, and is that something that's time sensitive? Because I, I know that there's an ask on paper, like there is yeah. for all delegations, but when they leave, there's a different ask. The trees are, I mean, that's really becomes a construction issue, so that's a spring a spring issue. Um, they're, like you said, the, you know, all things considered, uh, best case, they're, they're going to construct starting in June. Um, the, um, although through the design process, I think for them, clarity knowing that they can remove trees um, will assist them in, in developing that because if otherwise they may have to work around the Those trees, trees not knowing. So. so I guess, and knowing that they need to know, we might as well just deal with it today. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll do that separately. Okay. All right, so the motion on the floor is a letter saying we're um, in approval of a pump track and in support. So any other discussion around that? No? All right, I'll call that motion to vote. Vote is closed and it's carried. Councilor Earl, did you want to go on the tree one? Sure. <laughs> I cut you off. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I, uh, I th we're back onto the trees. So I would move that um, council agree to uh, waive existing policy around tree removal insofar as it's necessary for the construction of the pump track uh, to be determined by, by staff in consultation with the Mile Zero Park Society. Thank you, Councillor Earl. Second. Councillor Sudnick, any discussion? I will call this motion to vote. You were good on the motion tab? Yeah. Very slow coming up on the screen. <laughs> no question. There we go. Thank you, Tab. You're speedy and amazing. <laughs> we good? Vote is closed. It's carried. All right, so then I guess the next would be um, their request for the 2024 budget to have that water line looked at and replaced. So uh, did you want to speak to that first, Kevin? Or? So through your worship, um, just as we went through the discussion earlier in the agenda on the uh, report from Chelsea on the Splash, splash Park, um, 
maybe before we make a decision on this, we need to sit and talk with, with MOPS and determine um, just the extent of what, what is needed, if that is still needed, you know, depending on where we go. Um, yeah. Or, we, yeah, maybe that's, maybe we do that first. Again, not time sensitive. Okay. Um, something that won't be done until the summer. So maybe a discussion, um, and then we can come back if we need a direction on that. Yeah, and figure that out. Um, just something that they did bring up earlier, Kevin, that I just want to touch on is when they said about the playground being installed, that they drilled 72 holes or whatever and could have punctured a water line. Do you know anything about that or why that would be done? Do you know? No, so Three Your Worship, I, I don't have the details on that. Um, I would suspect that when the contractor was... Um, brought in, they would have done their line locates. We would have given them any information that we had as far as utilities there. Um, yeah. Oh, the, yeah, the geotech. But again, we would have given them the information. I mean, so they wouldn't have purposely drilled into this line. Yeah. Um, could they have by accident? Sure. Um, it is a seasonal line. That's why it's only two feet deep because it was never intended to be um, operational, you know, through the winter months. Um, that's pretty typical for a lot of our areas, such as the ball fields and the fairgrounds and all those. They're all seasonal lines. So the fact that it's shallow is, that's not unusual. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. And I guess too, like I, I, I understand the part of maybe waiting on this till we know about the misting park, but I think their bigger ask on this was that they want to put in a washroom facility that's year round in the, um, current water line wouldn't support that because of just being a couple of feet from the ground. So, yeah. Um, and and that being said, is it a little bit more time sensitive if they're planning on three years? We'll we'll have that discussion about the timing on on the washroom as well. And I think that's a that's a greater discussion. Is is it is it needed all year round or just more into the the shoulder seasons? Those are things we'll we'll talk about um, because again, if if it's year round. Um, you're going to have heat, obviously, to heat the facility year-round, and I'm not sure how much use there will be in the dead of winter down there, but those are discussions we'll have with okay. with Alex and, and understand that um, because building a year-round facility will be not only capital investment will be greater, but the operational will be significantly greater. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Councillor Parzel. Well, in addition to the points raised by the mayor. Um, there's also the, don't forget, and you'll, these will all come up in, in the discussion, so I agree completely what you're proposing. Don't forget uh, the uh, fire hydrant issue as well, okay? Um, it, this uh, whole area in this map is very proximal to the uh, village and the city has put a wonderful playground in there. And as you know, they will have all this rubber around the perimeter, and uh, as will the existing misting part, I believe. Um, so that's highly inflammable, I would guess. I don't know if it's got some chemicals in it to suppress it, but the firefighting issue is another dimension to explore with them when you have those discussions. Yeah, through your worship, we'll definitely talk to the fire department, the FPO, and determine um, how comfortable they are with access to the existing hydrants and if it is an issue. Because installing an additional hydrant and, and line, just a quick look at the map, there, there's some significant cost attached to that just because of where it has to come from. Thanks, Councillor Parzel. Thanks, Kevin. Um, we are getting to lunch, but I, I'll just move on to the last um, delegation that was here, uh, Michelle Mobley, um, from the South Peace Building Learning uh, Together. So their ask was a task force. So I, I think my I might just make the motion here to direct staff to reach out to them to get a little bit more information on what they're looking for. And if that means um, a liaison, a city staff member that sits on that board, um, there's definitely different levels uh, that we can appoint somebody. So... Um, I, I would just like to make that motion that we direct staff to look into what they're looking for. Councillors, uh, second by Councillor Sudnick. Um, I'll call that motion to vote. Okay. 
Vote is closed. It's carried. You didn't have. Um, all right, I'm going to break for lunch, so we'll come back at like 1240-ish. November 27th back to order. So our next order of business um, was 11 uh, Chief Administrative Officer Operational Updates. So over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, so through your worship, just the only thing I was going to touch on is that, uh, just a reminder, we have the Provincial Volleyball Championships uh, this upcoming weekend. Um, I think it starts, uh, is it Thursday, right? I think it starts Thursday, yeah, yeah, Thursday morning at 9, I think, is the opening ceremony. Yeah, so we have, uh, as of right now, as of this morning, um, the decking is going down on the ice surface at the memorial, and they're getting ready, and so things are moving. So for this week and most of next week, I think the ice users have been uh, displaced and uh, tried, you know, I think we've tried to manage some of that ice as best we can. And so, yeah, it's great news. We're going to have a lot of people in town uh, for that, so and some good volleyball going on down at the arena. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I forgot about, well, I didn't forget that I was going, but uh, such a great thing for our community and yeah, the amazing thing to go watch and support. Yeah, it's good. So that's really all I had that uh, for today. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, all right, next order of business um, is diary. Anything in the diary? Nothing in the diary. Um, next 13 consent calendars, a motion to accept the consent calendar. Councillor Sednick, second Councillor Kempf. Um, I'll call that to vote. The vote is closed, it's carried. Anything need to be lifted? No, all right. Uh, next order of business, 14, 2023 strategic priorities. 14.1, 2023 strategic priority chart. Um, I did touch a little bit earlier in my mayor's updates. I don't know if you had anything to add. So uh, through your worship, um, yeah, just we had a, a really good session last week, um, kind of digging into each one of those focus areas that uh, council identified and just unpacking them a little bit more. And and I thought it was um, really good. And I heard a lot of positive feedback from from staff just on just how it went and the experience. So that's great. And, I, and so we will uh, be starting tomorrow to... Uh, do some action planning around those and just uh, determining some time frames and who's accountable and, and whatnot. So that'll probably take a couple of meetings for us to finish off and, um, and we'll have something back to you as soon as we can for you to review. Perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, media questions. There's no media here. Um, 16 Committee of the Whole. So um, we do have a 16.1 re report from Staff Sergeant um, Hughes. He's uh, had a few things come up and is unable to attend today. So um, I don't know if, uh, I guess uh, Kevin and myself will be meeting with him um, in, the in the near future. So if there's any questions that, you know, council has um, to him, you can just direct them to, to Kevin or myself and we can ask. Um, but yeah, besides that, I guess just a motion to accept the report. Councillor Sudnick, second Councillor Kempf. I'll call that motion to vote. <clears throat> vote is closed. And that's carried. Um, so I guess our next order of business is to just a motion to close. Oh, we don't even have to, right? It says recess to close, but there's no closed. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone.